Okay, good morning, everyone. Welcome back to uh, day two. Um, I am Bray Patrick Lake. I am one of your co-chairs of this advisory committee. Um, and I come to this from the participant engagement side of things, and I am um, really excited to dive into day two. Before we get started, we have a couple of housekeeping items. For those of you joining us um, in this room today, if you need a taxi um, to the airport, please let our staff know outside the door. Um, they'll be happy to help you find a taxi, but it does take a few minutes to get a taxi here, so we need you to sign up in advance. Um, we also have our Faces of uh, Precision Medicine initiative video um, taping in a room just across the hall. So if you haven't stopped by to shoot a short video and uh, help us tell the story, um, we'd greatly appreciate if you could find time on a break and just uh, sneak over there and help us come up with some great material that really tells the story of what we're trying to do. Also, and this comes from kind of my world, we're having a very active Twitter conversation. So um, I know that the folks that are webcasting are, are actively using Twitter. If you're in this room and you, you do tweet, please go ahead and join the, the conversation online as well. That's hashtag PMI network, hashtag PMI network. So we're having a lot of fun and you'll hear the speakers up here presenting and people are actually reacting in real time and asking questions and joining in the dialogue. Um, and so there's a lot of rich discussion going on there. So um, I was particularly excited yesterday. We, you know, we came here to talk about the visionary biomedical research questions that can be addressed through a cohort like this. But most of all to me, by the time we went through the omics and the behavioral and the environmental, um, and then what can we use big data for, I was really struck by just how much all of the pieces are interrelated. And we have been working in silos, I think, too frequently, and patients have been gathering online, but we haven't had anybody to help us actually collect and do something useful with the data. Researchers, you need us, you need participants. We need to all be part of the same system working for common goals. And the possibilities to me yesterday were mind blowing. And then there's a piece of me as a patient that says, you know, I want this now. Why aren't we doing this now? And why aren't we doing this for all patients? Because we really do have the opportunities to improve health in this country and also wellness. When we started looking at um, a lot of the behavioral uh, opportunities and interventions and um, how much the environmental factors come into play, um, there's just such an opportunity and the things that we can do for patients in this country are truly amazing. And so we're gonna continue looking into that um, this morning. We're gonna start with- um, Someone has term. joined the conference. Thank you for joining and welcome. Um, so we are um, going to dive in and take a look at some of the near-term use cases and then move on with some longer-term use cases. And at this time, I will turn it over to Dr. Kathy Hudson, our co-chair, who will be leading this session. Good morning and welcome back. Um, this morning, we're going to be talking about uh, near-term and longer-term use cases. And really, uh, what we want to be able to outline is what questions we want to ask within the cohort and what answers we would like to get in the near term and the longer term. And answering these questions is going to be critical in order for the working group over the course of the very intense weeks and months ahead to really specify what will the cohort look like and um, how exactly will we be able to build it. So at the end of our February 11th and 12th workshop uh, here at NIH, Francis Collins laid out a series of possible use cases, and some of these may come up this morning in our discussion, both in the case of near-term and longer-term use cases. Uh, we talked about uh, the possibility of being able to identify the molecular cause of rare genetic diseases, of identifying protective uh, mutations for common diseases with high morbidity, identifying new pharmacogenetic predictors for efficacy and safety, or being able to uh, test the utilization of pharmacogenetic uh, predictors in real life, subclassify common diseases like type 2 diabetes, identify new biomarkers predictive of disease and being able to see how well those can be utilized, uh, identifying lifestyle and environmental predictors of disease, finding people who carry exceptional uh, genotypes, test um, the ability of using EHRs uh, and having those useful for participants as well as researchers, uh, being able to test the ability of healthcare delivery to be able to respond to evidence that's being generated within the cohort in real time, and also to test um, M Health applications. And we talked a little bit about this yesterday. So, those were possible use cases that we laid out a couple of months ago. Uh, at a workshop that we had here at NIH, and we now want to move that forward and really 
try to sketch out what are the use cases and what are the pros and cons of, of those use cases and actually using those as the exemplars to help us build and construct um, this cohort. So um, if you, the first time I ever came across the phrase use cases was in the health IT context and I'm not sure how frequently it's used outside of that context. So I looked online last night for sort of the definition of a use case and a couple of those definitions are here. A use case described a user's interaction with a system to achieve a goal or a sequence of actions that provide measurable value to an actor. And I think as we think about our use cases today, it's really important that we think about all of the actors that are gonna be involved in the cohort. Um, this is a diagram of a use case from uh, Google last night. I don't know exactly what language this is. Um, but what I really liked about all of these diagrams, and this sort of made me think about the metabolomics and um, metabolism pathways that we saw yesterday from Vamsi, is all of these interactions going on. But what's really interesting about use case diagrams uh, to a, a, every one of them is there's these little stick figures, right? It's about the people and how we're interacting with the people. And so um, who are the people in our case? So we wanna be thinking about for all of these use cases, what do these examples mean for researchers? What do they mean for research participants? What, what do they mean for healthcare providers, healthcare organizations, the private sector and the like? So as we're talking about our um, use cases this morning, I really want us to focus on um, the actors, the users, and what they will get out of um, these use cases in the short term. So this morning we're gonna focus in the first session on short term use cases and our panelists are gonna be first. Hypertrophy. Pardon me? <laughs> <laughs> You're gonna be rowdy today, aren't you, Zach? <laughs> That's good. I'll just make a diagnosis on your stick figure. Oh, <laughs> I, I actually want you to know that I drew this stick figure. That's why I said it was hypertrophy. Thank you, well, it's all right. Okay, so, um, so our speakers this morning, the, our first speaker is uh, Seth Kathiris, and, um, he is a member of our working group. In general, you may have noticed we've been having working group members moderating sessions but not actually giving talks. In this case, uh, he's uh, pitch hitting this morning um, for David L. Schuller, who couldn't be here this morning because of a family emergency. So we really appreciate you uh, diving in this morning. Um, and then I'll, invite, I'll uh, introduce the other speakers uh, after SEC. We're gonna stick to 10 minutes each and then have an animated conversation. So SEC. Well, thank you very much um, to Rick, Francis, and the uh, rest of the, the, the convening group uh, for inviting me to speak today and to be on the panel. So this is um, <clears throat> my topic. So I'm gonna really focus on, um, uh, focus on two uh, near-term uh, wins, I think, for the initiative. One is the idea that Dr. Collins brought up yesterday, the ability to distinguish cause from correlation. And second is the idea of identifying naturally occurring mutations that rather than increasing risk for disease, actually protect against disease and using these to inspire the development of new medicines. And I'm gonna uh, talk, give examples from heart attack, uh, the work that we've done and others have done in this area, just as illustrative of how these, uh, these use cases or these, uh, these principles uh, can be elucidated using this cohort. So heart attack, as you all know, is the leading cause of death in the U.S. and is also the leading cause of death worldwide. And for the last 100 years or so, one of the major questions has been, what causes heart attack? And answers or initial clues about etiologic agents have often come from observational epidemiologic studies. And this is actually one of the earliest ones. In fact, I think the earliest case control study for myocardial infarction, published in 1951. This is by Paul Dudley White uh, from my hospital, Mass General Hospital. And uh, and this, this sentence in the introduction, actually, I think is very apt. And what, what they wrote is the ability to prevent disease is generally proportional to the knowledge of the etiologic factors and pathogenesis of the disease. And at that time, there was actually very little known about what causes heart attack. And I actually think that this is the major goal, or should be the major goal of this initiative, to provide durable insights into causes of disease in order to enable new medicines, enable, to, no, enable new medicines and non-medicine treatments. So what did Dr. White and Gertler do? Well, they uh, uh, ascertained 97 men with heart attack prior to the age of 40 and 146 healthy controls and measured a lot of things. Sounds familiar to what we talked about yesterday. 
And uh, I think the, the range of measurements here are, are quite interesting. Actually, my favorite is, is I think, down here, which is uh, uh, the uh, re reducing intensity of saliva, which I don't really know what that is, but, um, <laughs> but it, it was measured. Uh, actually, that was one of the variables that was worse in the cases compared to controls. And they actually went into their final profiling uh, to determine risk. Uh, but one of the results that stood the test of time has been cholesterol. So here's the cholesterol mean in individuals who had a heart attack at a very young age, 286, and 224 in the controls. Okay, so higher cholesterol in individuals who developed a heart attack. So this suggested that cholesterol had something to do with heart disease. And subsequent to this, over the uh, next 40 years or so, that uh, relationship between cholesterol and heart disease has been refined into three separate associations between LDL, the so-called bad cholesterol, higher the level, higher the risk of heart attack, HDL, the so-called good cholesterol, higher the level, the lower the risk of heart attack, and then triglycerides, higher the level, higher the risk of heart attack. Okay, so uh, that's great, but are these relationships causal? This is actually what's been argued about, really, for many decades after that initial observation. And why was there an argument? And the reason is, as we know, that when you have a relationship between something measurable in the blood and risk of disease, a statistically significant relationship as denoted by this arrow, one, it might be because this directly causes the disease, but alternatively it could be because there's reverse causation going on, that actually the disease process alters the biomarker, or more commonly that there are actually confounding factors that relate both to the exposure and the outcome and observational epidemiology cannot distinguish between these three possibilities. And just to drive this home, because I think this is one of the major problems in biomedicine, the ability to distinguish, inability to distinguish cause from correlation, uh, just a silly example. So the proportion of hair that's gray on the x-axis, on the y-axis, the risk of coronary heart disease, and this is President Clinton, who did have coronary heart disease. So an increased risk of disease with more gray hair. So gray hair in the population is highly correlated with increased risk of MI. So did gray hair cause MI? And what about cutting off gray hair or dying it black? <laughs> Will it reduce risk of myocardial infarction? Yeah. I think Rick says he's tried it. Does it work? <laughs> no. Oh, sorry, I asked about it. <laughs> so uh, certainly, I think aging here, everybody can understand, is the confounder. So, uh, so why should we distinguish cause from correlation? And there are actually two major reasons that are often proposed. One is prediction and treatment. And actually, the reason to distinguish is not prediction. Okay, both causal and non-causal factors are e can be equally useful for prediction. And the example here is that if you had a room full of people, and I asked you to say, pick out the people who are at highest risk for heart attack, you wouldn't do a b bad job by just segregating in one corner of the room those who had gray hair. Right? That would actually be a pretty good predictor but certainly it's not a causal, predict, causal variable. So what the reason to distinguish is actually because of treatment. We only want to address uh, causal factors with the hope of reducing risk of disease. So there has been argument, for example, for the lipids for many years because we actually didn't have treatment trials that showed that if you reduce, ri reduce LDL, for example, you would reduce risk of heart attack. So the gold standard, of course, in to prove causality in humans is, was, is what Rob Kalis mentioned yesterday, drug intervention trials, where you randomize individuals into treatment and control, the biomarker would change in one group and not the other, and then you look for event rate differences between the two groups. Now it's very difficult to envision doing a randomized controlled trial for every variable you're interested in figuring out whether it's causal or not. So can we actually get at this in another approach beyond trials? And uh, about 20 years ago, Catan proposed the, oh, sorry, before I go there, for, for LDL, uh, it's actually been shown. It wasn't until 1995, so 41, 44 years after the initial observation, that uh, in the Wascops trial, the treatment with statin was shown to lower risk of heart a first heart attack. So for LDL, it's been proven based on randomized controlled trials. But can we actually get at this, again, ahead of having to do these trials? And uh, it's been proposed that genetics can help here. And the reason is the variant that you get from your parents is allocated to you randomly. And that randomization is akin to the randomization at a randomized controlled trial and it can potentially even out all confounders between the two groups that have the genotype and don't have the genotype. 
so that if you can find a genotype that relates to a biomarker of interest, then you simply ask whether the genotype also relates to disease risk in a manner predicted by the biomarker disease relationship. So this approach is called Mendelian randomization, and it essentially integrates um, DNA variants, biomarkers measurable in the blood or other biomarkers, and disease risk. And you, again, you ask, does the mutation here relate to disease risk in a manner predicted by one here, the DNA variant to, to biomarker relationship, and two, the, the biomarker to disease relationship. Okay, so we and others have asked this question for the lipid fractions that I mentioned earlier, LDL, HDL, and triglycerides. And so for LDL, again, the question is, do people with LDL-raising genetic mutations have higher MI risk? And for HDL, the question would be, do people with HDL-raising genetic mutations have lower MI risk? Because this is supposed to be protective. If causal, the answer to both of these questions it would be yes for both biomarkers. For LDL, the answer is a resounding yes. So mutations that raise LDL that lead to genetically elevated LDL lifelong markedly increase risk of myocardial infarction. Surprisingly, the answer for HDL was no. That basically people who carry HDL boosting variants have the same risk for heart attack as those who don't carry HDL raising variants. So these genetic data suggested that HDL is a marker of risk rather than causal factor and also predicted that medicines which raise HDL will not likely reduce risk of heart attack. So shortly after um, these genetic data were presented, a randomized controlled trial that actually uh, looked at a medicine which raised HDL was, was reported. And here are the HDL data. This is about 16,000 people in this trial. Mean HDL at start was 42 for both groups. The HDL was rose to 55 in the group that got the medicine and uh, didn't in the placebo group. But there was no difference in event rates between the two groups. Okay, so this was quite a surprise and really several billion dollars in drug development that went into this. So um, what about triglycerides? So we've done this experiment for triglycerides and it turns out that people who have triglyceride raising mutations actually do have higher risk of myocardial infarction. So here's an example of using gene variants, biomarkers, and a given disease, integrating them to really distinguish cause from correlation and pointing to the fact that LDL and triglycerides are likely are causal factors and appropriate targets for therapy, whereas HDL cholesterol likely is not. So, this gets to the second major use case of, uh, that I want to highlight, which is, can you now take this information and then move one step forward and say, which ways of lowering LDL or triglycerides will actually reduce heart attack risk? And it, that's actually, I think, possible in the context of, a, of, the, of the study that's being proposed. And that's the idea of actually now looking for specific targets uh, for medicines and, and, and prioritizing targets where naturally occurring mutations protect against disease. So let me just take a couple of minutes to walk you through this. For heart attack, despite all these years of research, there are really only just two therapies that prevent a first heart attack. One is aspirin and the other is statins, and both do so in terms of a relative risk reduction that's quite modest. So why don't we have more medicines? And it's because we have uh, a really big problem in terms of getting medicines all the way to clinic. Only about 5% of medicines in development succeed all the way into the clinic. That's a very, very bad batting average, way below the Mendoza line. And why is that? There are two reasons to stand out. One is the models that we use for chronic disease are poorly predictive, particularly cells and mouse for um, diseases like atherosclerosis. And we often don't know the impact of blocking a gene over many years. So the idea that's developed is that we, if we can identify naturally occurring mutations in humans that protect against disease and develop medicines that mimic them, we'll have a greater success rate than we've had in the past for medicines development. And this concept is pictorially shown in the next couple of slides. You have a population at large. You take a subgroup or find a subgroup that carries a mutation. So this, this group here shown in blue, and these individuals have lower risk of disease. And so this now points to a specific gene that if you can develop a medicine that mimics the mutation, you'd have a high likelihood of success, a higher likelihood of success in terms of um, 
uh, in terms of treatments. So uh, this is, sounds great in concept. Uh, are there examples of this? And so the first example in, in, in the cardiovascular space is for this gene called PCSK9. And it, uh, Catherine Boulot initially identified the gene in 2003 as a cause of high LDL. Subsequently, Jonathan Cohen and Helen Hobbs showed that you can find one in 50 African Americans in the United States carries a mutation that disables one copy of the gene. As a result, they have lower LDL and markedly lower risk of myocardial infarction, suggesting that if you developed a medicine that actually interfered with this protein, you would actually get the same effects. And those medicines are in development and now in phase three trials. And in phase two studies, they're very promising. They, they markedly lower LDL, and they're likely to lower risk of heart disease, and we'll know that in two years. So there are two other examples that have been developed in the last year. Another gene called NPC1L1, where about one in 650 people carry a mutation that disables one copy of the gene. As a result, they have lower LDL and about 50% lower risk of heart attack, and there's already a drug in the clinic, azetamide, that actually mimics the mutations. Finally, there's a mutation in, in a gene called APOC3. One in 150 in the United States carry a mutation that disables one copy of the gene, lower triglycerides, and they have about 40% lower risk of heart attack. And there are drugs in development against this uh, to mimic this, these mutations as well. I want to highlight one last thing regarding the APOC3 mutation. These mutations lower triglycerides and lower risk of heart attack. And so immediately, you know, you ask people, we, we can ask, why are these people protected? And um, that, that question now can be answered in the context of studying the individuals who carry exceptional genotypes. And this is, I think, something that is potentially very uniquely possible in the context of a precision medicine initiative where the patients can be recalled. So you take individuals without the mutation, with the mutation. In this case, there was a dietary fat challenge that was performed in the two groups, and bloods measured for every hour for six hours afterwards. And I think the results are extremely interesting where if you take indi individuals without the mutation, after a fatty meal, about four hours, the triglycerides triples from 60 to 180. Okay, so what about the people who carry the mutations? Their triglycerides don't budge at all in the blood. And since we are postprandial 20 out of the 24 hours of the day in the United States, this you can now see why that basically that, that, that there's a benefit for these patients. Okay, so um, the idea is to leverage naturally occurring variation and target genes to anticipate efficacy, and also you can play this game for side effects as well. So I think these are two very important near-term, potential near-term wins for the cohort. And I'll close with this slide, which is how can we achieve these near-term wins for any given disease, not just for the heart attack uh, 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 problem that I, that I talked about, and I, I think there are two major items that are needed. One is a reference sample, and the characteristics of which are listed here, and a couple of these speakers yesterday talked about the variety of things that people would want. You would definitely would need genomic data, biomarker data, recall capability, and the ability to link genetics to biomarkers and disease. But I also think it's important to really think about potentially oversampling for given diseases or a set of diseases and have the ability to contrast these cases to the controls to bring really the Paul Dudley White study that I showed you in 1951 to really the modern era. Thank you. Thank you. So our next speaker is Josh Stein, who comes to us from Adhere Tech. He is the CEO and co-founder. Josh? Oh, you're behind me. You're behind me. Hello. Great. Thank you very much. Uh, so my name is Josh. I'm the CEO and co-founder of Adhere Tech. We make patented smart pill bottles that track and improve medication adherence. First, I just want to say I'm very honored to be asked to speak here today. So thanks, everyone, very much for their time. Uh, usually when we talk about our technology, we talk about it within the context of medication non-adherence. So non-adherence, obviously, one of the largest problems in healthcare today. Average adherence rates are really low at about 60%. Uh, low adherence is responsible for 125,000 premature deaths in the U.S. each year, $300 billion in costs, $100 billion in lost revenues. 
But uh, within the uh, world of precision medicine, when I think about our technology, um, we hear a lot about the treatments that are being developed, but not so much about the delivery of how and if patients are actually going to take these meds. We spend billions on developing the medication and data analysis, but not sort of wondering if and how patients will take them. With the current technological offerings, in fact, we don't have any insight as to if they're taken, when, how, and why. So uh, an example that I'd like to give is, I mean, if you think about a world-class athlete, this athlete has a nutritionist that tells them what and how to eat, a trainer that tells them when to work out and what exercises to do, and a coach telling them when to practice and how to practice. The reason why those are so effective is not only because they're tailored to that specific athlete, but it's because the delivery of those uh, treatments is really good. The coach is there to help the athlete do all those activities, and the athlete's also really highly engaged. But as we know in healthcare, patients really aren't that engaged oftentimes. So it's important to make sure that these medicines and treatments are delivered in the right way, uh, both during the development of these treatments and the actual implementation. So uh, that's why we developed uh, the AdhereTech Smart Pill Bottle. So here's how it works. Uh, basically, what we've done is we've put a cellular chip inside of this bottle. So the same sort of chip you find inside of a cell phone, smartphone, or pager, it's built into the bottle. Whenever the patient uses this bottle, data is automatically sent to us. Basically, it tells us what the patient's doing. Our system gets all this data in real time, analyzes it in real time, and compares it to what a patient should be doing. If it notices a discrepancy, like a patient didn't take uh, their meds, we intervene. We do that in a series of fully customizable ways. Um, these include on-bottle lights and chimes, so the bottle lights up. You'll see in a few moments the bottle beeps. We also do automated phone call or text message alerts as well. So we have on-bottle alerts, and we have phone alerts, and in a few moments the bottle will also flash a bunch of different colors. But uh, all the data that we get, it's populated on our dashboard in real time as well. And uh, this data, researchers have access to 24-7. The data can be uh, split in any which way. But the real important thing is that everything happens in real time. Uh, you can see what the patients are doing or what they're not doing. So uh, the reason why uh, you know, the reception toward our technology has been really great is because we're collecting types of data that have uh, never been collected before because not only are we tracking patients' real-time adherence, we're also tracking their reasons for non-adherence um, and their reactions to meds. The way we do that is through what we call our patient feedback feature. So the way that works is if a patient doesn't take their meds, or even if they do, uh, but if they don't, they get their reminders, um, the ones I just showed you. Uh, if a certain period of time passes and the patient still hasn't taken their meds, we then ask them why. And we can also ask them why if they do take their meds to sort of get an idea about side effects that may or may not be occurring. Based on the patient's responses to the questions that we ask them via text or automated phone call, we route that to live nurses, and then nurses can help uh, intervene with that patient immediately if the patient needs it. But collecting this data has value even beyond the real-time interventional aspects. Um, and the way I'd like to illustrate this is to issue another example. So uh, imagine if I asked you what you had for lunch last Thursday. Chances are you couldn't remember. Even if you could, you probably couldn't say what you liked about the meal and what you didn't. Um, that's somewhat analogous to how a lot of this, how patients are reacting to medication information is collected today. A patient will go to a doctor. Doctor will say, well, why didn't you take your meds? Or how is it treating? Uh, how is it working for you? And not only is the patient's answer quite outdated, but uh, by oftentimes weeks, or even longer, but they're also giving one answer for many unique instances of non-adherence. So by collecting this data in real time, we'll better be able to see how this medication interacts with patients and uh, you know, better target uh, in the precision medicine landscape different meds to different patients. In regard to the use cases for our technology, uh, we see the biggest adoption in the clinical trial and research space, so uh, the application is pretty self-evident, you know, we're collecting all this data in real time. Uh, the main overarching goal is to collect better data and to speed up trials to basically understand which meds work better for patients in the short term. Um, we also see a lot of adoption in the commercial specialty space, so uh, our bottles are currently distributed through some specialty pharmacies 
for cancer medications. Uh, but in every case, it's a free solution for patients. We are actually a for-profit entity, so we ch uh, charge either you know, researchers or pharma, whoever's most appropriate, uh, to use our technology for these purposes. A little bit about our technology. Um, we've, uh, our bottles have been used in various trials since 2013. Uh, pretty even split between clinical trials and research and uh, commercial specialty meta, uh, medication distribution. We're working with a bunch of top pharma companies. Uh, we can't say who they are due to confidentiality, but we can say some of the great research institutions with whom we work. Uh, the Walter Reed National Military Medical Center, right down the street, while Cornell University of Michigan, a bunch of others as well, and also speaking with some institutions in this room. Um, so really excited about that. Uh, but the bottles are really flexible. They can be distributed in any number of ways. So um, we know that whenever we uh, talk about our technology to a bunch of people that have a lot of uh, experience in the space, they tell us about similar solutions that they've seen in the past. Uh, we always like to differentiate ourselves. Uh, and the way we do that is to describe what we see as this inherent flaw in every other uh, solution that may be used for real-time monitoring or real-time data collection for research purposes. So every other solution has this flaw in that they're asking patients, who are oftentimes not engaged, to go through complicated processes to set up these solutions or complicated processes to use these solutions each and every time they take their meds. I'll give some examples. So you have apps. Apps not only require patients to have a smartphone, they say, now you need to download the app, set up the app, engage with the app every day. Big Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday pill boxes, they require set up every week. Big clunky piece of equipment, they require patients to learn new behaviors. Um, and then there's also other solutions that require Wi-Fi, Bluetooth, some sort of syncing or connectivity that a lot of patients either don't have access to or won't go through the trouble to use. So when we created our solution, we said we need to build something that literally, literally requires zero patient setup and zero new behaviors for the patient in order to use it. We needed to create something that was totally passive, and that's exactly what we've done. So because we have cellular technology in the bottle, the bottle connects and works the moment the patient receives it. There's literally zero setup. You give it to a patient, it's sending data. Um, it's also used just like a normal pill bottle, standard push down and turn cap. Um, the battery on the bottle lasts 200 days on a single charge. It's rechargeable just like a cell phone. Uh, but the whole goal is to have patients do nothing new, including, you know, hopefully most will not have to charge it throughout the life of the time they use the bottle. And uh, we have some additional neat features as well, like automated refill sensors, but uh, a little less relevant today. Um, really customizable and, uh, you know, we can, the messaging that we send to patients can say whatever we want it to say based on the drug, disease, state, or demographic. High-tech patients can get text messages. Low-tech patients can get automated phone calls. So it works for patients of every technological savviness level. Um, of course, we're an FDA registered class one medical device, HIPAA compliant, a bunch of other regulations as well. And it's uh, designed and built in the USA. So um, this is some of the press we've gotten. I only mention this to say that the reception toward these monitoring technologies has gone beyond all the thought leaders in this room. And I mean, it really does resonate with the public because there really is a wide acknowledgement for needs for precision medicine and you know, technologies that can help patients become healthier in easy and simple ways. Uh, we also have a TED Talk talking about how easy it is, how, how it's so important to make these technologies so seamless and easy in order to facilitate adoption. So uh, as I wrap up, uh, I just want to say that, you know, the thoughts I want to leave you with is, you know, not only is this technology available and uh, would we be honored to work with everyone here for any sort of research purposes, but it's really easy, um, it's totally passive for patients, it's customizable, and all the data that uh, researchers want to see is populated in real time. So uh, with that, I'll see you all on the panel. But if you want to contact me, uh, information's up there. But thank you very much. So I think as we talk about <clears throat> use cases, it'll be interesting to talk about how we do, in fact, monitor what kinds of um, uh, medications people are taking. We can, from the EHR, monitor prescriptions that are given. We can monitor. Um, presumably how many people are actually filling the prescriptions, which we know is a significant drop. And then in terms of actual compliance, how can we use either gadgets or chemistry 
to see whether or not people are actually complying with uh, their prescriptions that are being offered by their physicians. So our next speaker is um, Howard Hugh, who is coming uh, to us from uh, Canada, from the University of Toronto School of Public Health. And um, Howard, thank you very much. Thanks very much. Um, I have been an American and was born in New York, but was recruited to Toronto two and a half years ago. When I told my wife I was coming to uh, attend a workshop on uh, precision medicine at the invitation of the NIH director, she said, and she's a lawyer, she said, so after 25 years of telling me when, when uh, you couldn't really describe why you wanted me to take a medicine, that it's, there's an art to medicine, now you're telling me that science is finally getting to be, become a precise way of doing medicine? And I told her, well, you know, we may have some explaining to do in the medical field on what precision medicine actually means and how we prescribe and how this relates to the practice of medicine. This talk is going to focus on something a little bit different. First of all, I do want to appreciate the last talk because innovation is so important not only to medicine but also to public health. And there's opportunities throughout public health to actually um, invest in innovation. But second of all, I think that uh, there is a often a divide seen between prevention and public health and medicine, and that's beginning to blur because as you get into precision medicine and the the opportunities that are presented by truly understanding the mechanism of disease, there are opportunities to do prevention at a scale, at multiple scales, not only in terms of policy, but also in terms of secondary prevention. What if <clears throat> you found out that much of Alzheimer's disease perhaps the most feared disease of all of us, to lose our minds, uh, is related to lead exposure. Lead exposure we actually had in the 1950s and 1960s. In those of us who are genetically susceptible and through a mechanism involving epigenetic modification. Actually, the evidence for this is actually growing. Nasser Zawiya's work at the University of Rhode Island, not only in monkeys and in mice, shows that early life lead exposure can result in programming that gives you latent overexpression of the amyloid precursor protein without any additional lead exposure late in life. And he's been able to show that, in fact, early life lead exposure in primates causes amyloid-like plaques when we get older. And our research is beginning to show, in fact, that we can demonstrate epigenetic modifications from lead exposure that are very suggestive of a kind of mechanism that will get us to a late-life disease that we fear. And let me remind you that we have not been able to find an environmental cause of Alzheimer's disease, despite twin studies that clearly show that environment must contribute to more than 50% of Alzheimer's disease. And what if we found that there were molecular pathways for, for preventing the process from happening? And that's what I'd like to talk about a little bit today. Now, the lead exposure that I'm talking about is something everybody in this room has in their body. Okay? This is data from the National Health and Nutrition Examination Survey national survey, showing that, in fact, the average blood levels in 1975 were around 12 or 13 micrograms per deciliter. That's about three orders of magnitude higher than it was for prehistoric man. And once we took lead out of gasoline, out of the solder that was used in food cans, out of uh, paint, then the blood level started to decline dramatically. And this is just uh, what you're looking at is average blood levels in NHANES data and quarterly sales figures of lead and gasoline, just giving you an, a, an appreciation of just how closely these are related. Okay? So this is not actually fantasy. Uh, this is actually something that we are worrying about a lot in environmental health. I'm not able to advance the slide. Yeah. 
Well, what I can tell you I was going to talk about. Okay. <laughs> This is, uh, I need to get to the next one. There we go. Now the question is, who in this room really knows how much lead exposure they had when they were in utero or in the first few years of life? And the answer is, we have no idea. And that's part of the problem. The part of the problem is that, in fact, lead exposure in the typical human being happens through pathways that are multiple, they're complex, here's the human being down here, there's no way we would know. This actually is a, um, a pathway that was uh, developed by the Environmental Protection Agency. <coughs> and when I first saw this, I thought that this was describing the bureaucracy at EPA. <laughs> uh, but in fact, it is lead exposure pathways. Um, but in fact, if we had participated in environmental birth cohort studies, the kind of studies that uh, uh, NIEHS has been funding, we would know. This is a study we did in which we actually took plasma lead samples from moms at each stage of pregnancy, first and second, third trimester, then followed the offspring till age two, measured their intelligence using the Bailey scales of mental, in, of, uh, of, um, mental development, and showed, in fact, the first trimester of plasma lead exposure was far more predictive than the second or third trimester in negatively predicting intelligence at age two. And this is after uh, controlling for all the usual confounders. And when you marry that with the basic science uh, that's been done on lead impacts on cellular systems, um, then uh, you can see, in fact, that uh, there's a logic to this. Uh, lead can cause uh, intellectual impairment at levels far below that traditionally associated with toxicity. It has to do with uh, interference with uh, synaptogenesis. And now we're worrying about the kinds of genetic programming that might actually result in late stage, late onset adult disease like Alzheimer's. So here's the opportunity. Some of you may have seen this word for the first time, exposomics. Because it's so difficult for anybody in this room to understand how much they're exposed to or the timing of their exposures, whether it was metals or there was pesticides, it's radiation or anything else. And yet we're so, um, it's so important for us to understand the environmental footprint uh, on disease, not just for policy, but also to understand who we can screen, who we can perhaps develop interventions for. We've turned to trying to use human biology itself as a pattern recognition tool for understanding what our exposures might be. And that's what expose, exposomics is all about. This is Chris Wilde's uh, figure uh, giving you a map of what the exposure dimensions might be thought of. It proposes to use available measures of external and human exposures combined with the high throughput methods that all of you, you have been hearing about to develop a comprehensive profile of human exposures. The problem here is that unless you actually marry a big initiative like precision medicine with other initiatives that finely detail what that human exposures are like and use the precise, correct tools, and I say precise because you have precise tools for omics, we barely have them for any of the 75,000 ex common exposures that human beings now are exposed to. But if you can develop those precise tools, then you have a much better chance of disentangling and understanding the environmental footprint on disease. And here, by the way, is a study we did, again, using our birth cohort data, showing that prenatal lead exposure does lead to genomic methylation patterns that are quite distinct. And it's we're just connecting the dots. And this is the kind of research uh, we can hope to do. So. The idea would be that the PMI national cohort is a big opportunity to incorporate environmental exposure sub-cohorts. That is, think about harnessing some of those studies that have already been funded with detailed environmental characterization so we can come up with better indicators of exposure dosimetrics and timing, right? There are vulnerable stages of life, so we have to understand how the exposures come and go. 
and potential new targets for interventions. And again, it's not just policy interventions, but perhaps even molecular targets that are specific for the environmental exposures that we have enjoyed or, or over our lifetime. Some of it might be the kinds of things that are already being developed, RNA interference approaches, for instance, but there may be the unknowns, and that's where we have to be, um, we have to accommodate this kind of thinking. So here we are with uh, a, a schematic representation of the PMI cohort, and the idea is to identify these subcohorts in which we can truly understand precisely what their exposures are so we can take advantage of the PMI to develop these kinds of ex exposome of tools. Now, the other aspect of um, that example I gave is to think of PMI not only as a cohort study in which we do longitudinal follow-up and document the exposures and figure out what the uh, diseases are, but we can actually chop up the cohort into discrete, simultaneously observable segments. So we can actually look at exposures in early life and how that relates to programming events. Then see how these things may change over time simultaneously by looking at middle-aged cohorts and things like epigenetic drift. And then do the kinds of case control studies or nested case control studies that would tell us whether these genetic program patterns may actually predict those diseases we worry about. We don't have to wait 75 years to do this kind of molecular approach to understanding the causes of Alzheimer's disease. Now, in terms of the other themes I just want to touch on before I step down, data linkage and global collaborations. Uh, in Canada, we have the advantage of um, having administrative databases that are finely detailed and linked with electronic medical records ever since we developed universal health coverage systems. So, for instance, here in Ontario, we have uh, not only uh, the Ontario Health Study, which is a population-based cohort study, very much like PMI, over 230,000 individuals now, uh, but we can link that to ISIS, which is the institute that's been developed Every time you swipe your card and do anything with a physician or a healthcare practitioner, get a drug, it deposits data. We have access to that on over 17 million Ontarians for the last 20 years. And we can do things like this, which is link all of this data together to get at upstream social environmental work uh, predictors all the way downstream, not only to health outcomes, but use of the health systems and health systems uh, utilization data. PMI may have that opportunity as well by linking with databases, whether it's Kaiser, uh, Seattle Group Health, or other administrative databases. So our goal is to inject some of these thinkings into something like the NCI precision medicine, epigenetic and environmental related abnormalities that might lend themselves to prevention. And just as a reminder, these are the kinds of things that, from the public health sphere, are investments that are well worth the money. Public health investments are a big, big driver of getting those health care costs down. Thank you very much. So our last speaker, before we have uh, opened this up to discussion, is Anne Wojcicki. She is the uh, founder, uh, co-founder and CEO of 23andMe, which has been providing genetic information directly to consumers and has a lot of experience in what consumers are looking for and uh, certainly can uh, provide some of those insights to us today. Anne? <laughs> Where's the, oh, there's the clock. Where's the timer? The timer? Oh, just you? Yeah. Just when you come to harass me? Excellent. <laughs> you, <laughs> I need to bring you everywhere. Um, <laughs> all right, so we'll go through um, uh, 23. By the way, just raise your hand. How many people know 23 me pretty well? I assume all of you. Oh, I love you. Um, <laughs> my kind of crowd. So first and foremost, we all talk about engaging the consumer. Um, a couple points that I just really want to emphasize here. If you don't return the data back to customers or patients, as, as we call them here, you're not going to engage them. 
So they want to know about their research. They want to know what's happening. They want to know what you are doing. They want to be part of it. They want to feel like they're part of the solution. So a key tenant, you will not have an engaged cohort if you do not return the data back to customers. The second thing I would just emphasize here is that if, if you engage me in research, but then you tell me I have to pay $25 to read about what happened to me, it is insulting. And so you have to, 23andMe, when people do collaborations with 23andMe, we require that they publish in open access journals, not because we're trying to change all of that, but I can't tell my customers that they then have to go and pay money to read about what happened to them. So you can't have a really engaged cohort unless you have those two principles. So a couple things about 23andMe. We have actually been doing research since 2009. Um, we put out um, questionnaires to our customers as a self-report format. And just we all talk about EHRs, and EHRs are the gold standard. Um, we overwhelmingly love self-report data. If anything, EHRs are an incredible amount of work to clean up. Um, we've done sort of head-to-head -head studies on EHRs versus self-reported data, and it's a lot of work. It's great for the drug history, potentially great for, um, for the labs, but just one thing to think about is the self-report data actually works much better than what anyone anticipates. We now have over 950,000 people who have signed up. Uh, over 250 million phenotypic data points have been collected. Uh, and over 80% of our customers actually consent for research. And this is very broad research where we can go back and we can, re we can uh, recontact individuals and they have consented for us to do essentially unlimited research with their, with their uh, genome within 23andMe. So, and 75% of our customers have, so when they sign up, they actually take this health intake form so something that looks like this, or they've taken another survey that we've targeted. So by having a survey right there in the beginning, we then can retarget additional surveys to them based on what they have filled out. So one of the imp other important things is thinking about people not necessarily as a human subject, but as a customer. And I think when I think about, when people ask us, why do you have so many people and why are people so engaged, it's because we treat them like customers and not like subjects and not this mentality that like, I need to go and get everything from you and then I'm gonna run. But, but we actually anticipate that we're gonna actually have a lifelong relationship with our customers. So because of that, we have an incredible engagement. So over 30% of our customers have it logged in in the last 30 days. When we send an email out to our customers, we have an average of 42% are actually opening it and 10% are actually clicking through. And compared to the industry standard, which is you know, roughly half and a third of actually what it is. So here we are, we're much more engaging than most things that are out there. So, so people clearly want to be engaged with their health and they want to be engaged with research. So when we think about it, what is actually more fun? People love learning about themselves and they love, especially if they have a disease or a condition, they actually wanna know what is going on. So this is an example. This is just sort of a graph that shows how much phenotypic data we're collecting every day. We sent one quick question to our customers, and in 60 hours, we collected over 5 million phenotypic data points. So when you think about that research potential, you send out an email, and you can collect millions of data points on your customers. So this is also something that just illustrates how much people want their genomes. So it's a graph of everyone who has actually bought our kit since we launched. And even despite when we had the FDA warning letter and there was negative press about us, all the people who were still continuing to buy, people want their genetic information. And so it's super exciting that you actually, as we're thinking about launching PMI, People actually want this. They're super excited about the genome. And watching it unravel is like one of the greatest novels of our time. So how can we actually engage them in this story that we're all helping to decode? So now the question, what are we gonna do with all this data? So we, here we have 950,000 customers, you know, a thousand or more joining every single day. All this phenotypic data, what can you do? So one of the most exciting things that we can do is this idea of a real-time GWAS and a FIWAS study. So meaning, 
um, we have all these individuals. So this is just sort of a snapshot of, of 23andMe from a couple months ago. So something like 11,000 people with Parkinson's disease and over 480,000 confirmed controls. You know, 162,000 people with the high-risk variant for Alzheimer's disease. And then things like 1,600 people who actually have colorectal cancer and all of those controls. So what can you do with all that data? So this is actually where we have the 23andMe research portal where you can log in. This is something that we use in-house and we have some groups that are actually externally using it. But you log in and you can actually run real-time queries. So imagine that potential, you have a million people, you have a hypothesis, you just log in the same way you do a search today. You wanna learn about something, you just type it in. So you type it in. So this is something I just did last night, I was playing around, brain aneurysms. You have all these different phenotypes on the left side that you can start to just browse through and you can see what was the question that we asked and then how many cases and how many controls and in each ethnicity. So how many you have. And then based on this, you can actually then go and recontact individuals to see would they want to give more information or do they want to be more engaged. So this is actually then in a real-time GWAS that we're able to run in Parkinson's disease. And you can see that things like LERC2 and SNCA and GBA all show up as being some of the high-risk variants for, for, for Parkinson's disease. And then you can actually then sort it based on sort of what are the strongest associations. And of course, you have LERC2 there, which is well known to be associated with Parkinson's disease, sorting at the top. And then this is a, a FIWAS study that we've run on the FTO, a SNP in the FTO gene, which is associated, was found years ago, associated with obesity. And what does it show up in the 23andMe database? The number one phenotypes are body mass index and obesity. So the system, now you can just run these things like a query. So based on this, we've run, you know, we have over 30 publications and we have, you know, hundreds of academics that have actually worked on this and pharma partners that have worked on this. Tons of publications have come out and kind of on anything, this is one that just came out on motion sickness, not necessarily something that you're gonna get a grant for, but something that was really interesting to our consumers. So this is another example. The second thing that you can actually start to do with all this data is decoding variants of unknown significance. So this is actually a project um, where a family came to us and they had three generations of pancreatic cancer. And we actually took the sequence, the tumor to Rick Lifton and he very generously sequenced it for us and we found a mutation in the MLH1 gene and it was hypothesized, it was a significant mutation, it was hypothesized that because MLH1 is associated with colorectal cancer, it was hypothesized that this mutation was significant enough that that was probably the causative mutation. So here you have a family that's interested, is this the causative mutation, because they have children, they wanna know what to do next, is it? So what do we do, 23andMe, we go to 23andMe, and we see, does anyone else in the 23andMe database have this same mutation? And so yes, 157 people had this same mutation. So what do we do then? We put out a cancer survey. So we put out a survey about family history of cancer, and in 12 hours, we get 12,000 responses. This is years ago, so the database was much smaller. And what we find, 26 people did not take the survey, 118 did not have cancer, 13 did have a family history of cancer or had cancer, but zero had pancreatic cancer. So based on this information, we were very quickly able to take a variant of unknown significance in a mutation, in a gene that is known to be associated with cancer, and say this is unlikely to actually be the causative mutation for this hereditary pancreatic cancer. So it's not 100% here, but this was later followed up in other journals that this is not a mutation associated with pancreatic cancer. So the third thing that we potentially do is finding sort of what we call the impossible and the ability to recontact. So this is an example. Uh, researchers came to us and they had found individuals who had um, both the GBA mutation and the LERC2 mutation. And LERC2 is typically one in 10,000. GBA is one in 1,000. So technically, if you were a researcher trying to find these people, you would never find these individuals. And so we looked in our database and we found, wow, we actually have 17 of these people. And so this academic wanted to do a punch biopsy and we emailed them 
and we got eight people to enroll in 36 hours. So something that was never feasible before, we can actually now do. So same with APOE, we actually found we have over 130,000 individuals who are high, the high risk variant for, um, for Alzheimer's disease. And we wanted to see, could we find people who were over 75, had the variants and did not have the disease? So we actually searched for them and we found people over 75, one or two copies of the high risk variant, and they took a survey. They actually went through and they took this cognitive impairment survey. And what we found is we had 80 people who actually passed all those metrics and they agreed. They spat again, they spat in two more tubes and we did whole genome sequencing on them. This is an example that actually came up yesterday. Somebody in the room came to me and said they were interested specifically, do you have any human knockouts in this gene? So I just went and I did a search. I looked for it and so this was the RS number and yes, I have 160 people, different ethnicities, and they're all recontactable. So then what does that kind of research that we can now in, um, in, uh, you know, help the academic world in terms of finding these people? So I'll go quickly go through these because I see Kathy. Um, the phase four studies and the real life data. So this is a part project that we actually did uh, with Genentech, helping, pe helping them understand individuals who had been on a Vastin for more than a couple years. And so this was after they actually had, after Avastin was taken off the market for breast cancer. Um, and what we were able to find 250 people, 150 of them were genotyped, and then they went, we sent them tubes so they could go to any lab core in the country, and over 75% of them actually gave us blood samples. So people are willing to do all these types of things. This is something that we also put out to customers just on um, commonly used medications. And you can look at something like Tylenol, and all this data, 75,000 people started filling this out and we can start to see how based on ethnicity and gender and age, whether or not people think Tylenol works for them. This has never really been looked at that much before. So prevention is something that people have talked about here. People want to prevent disease. This is a Robert Greene at Harvard, one of his papers that, um, or uh, one of the early publications that came out about that, is that people are getting this data and they want to make a change. So the genetic information is that impetuous to get people to motivate to change. What we have now is an API. We have over 1,200 people, 1,200 active developers who have applied to 23andMe to get access to the data because they want to build applications with all this data. And so when we think about is there a world to partner with groups who are going to think about prevention, we can do that. People want to develop and we can connect in with them. And last, I don't want to forget about consumer education, because as much as we all are studying mostly disease, there has to be a fun element to it. So while the dress is not a top NIH priority, is it, Francis? Um, <laughs> it's really interesting for the customers. This is something that went viral. It was crazy. But it was obviously clearly really interesting. So we put this out to our customers. And really, within a week's time, we're able to actually see how much do people actually respond to the different dress colors. And it's insanity, because it's clearly white and gold. <laughs> and so, <laughs> so, so you can then start to do these kinds of real-time associations. Something's hot in the culture, engage them. And we didn't find a genetic association here, but maybe there's gonna be something on the next one. And this is to a way to engage the public to get them to be excited. So just want to emphasize again those last two points. Contact me with any questions. So why don't panelists come over here and we'll assemble and uh, have a conversation. So I'm going to start by asking the panelists to talk about um, so in some cases we talked about specific use cases, in some cases we talked about examples of specific technologies that could be deployed in the cohort. But in thinking about a specific use case, if you were, um, so we launched the cohort in FY16 and we're now in 2020. Um, in your wildest dreams, what would we be able to have told research participants? And maybe Anne will start with you and then come down the row. What will we be able to tell research participants um, that is of value to the research participants from their participation in the short term? Because I think that's really going to dictate 
the success over the long term is that participants early on are deriving um, substantial value from their participation. So Anne, you wanna start and then we'll come uh, this way, Howard. So I, I, re I think that research, sorry, participants are realistic that research takes a long time. And I think actually e the simplest thing, one of the most meaningful things that you can do for individuals is that individuals just wanna know that people are working with their data. And we routinely, when we bring in user groups, people are upset when they find out that they have cancer. They go and they participate in a clinical trial and then their samples are sitting in a freezer. And it's really demotivating to them. And so people just wanna know that their data is being used. So when you think about short term, People just want to know that lots of people, it will be a huge success if you say there's a thousand people who've used their data. And you can almost create it sort of like that Facebook page app, like who has the most publications associated with them? Who has the most researchers? Who's the most interesting person to study? Thank you. You know, I did focus groups years ago and about uh, potential participation in a cohort like we're now planning. And uh, I remember doing a focus group in Seattle with some sort of young tech savvy folks, and um, one of the things that we heard in a resounding um, enthusiasm was being able to sort of log on and see exactly that. Who's using my samples and my information, and what are they learning from that? And that was just really gratifying to people. They really wanted to see that. Howard, what would we get out in, 20, in 2020 for participants? I've been trying to inject the environmental uh, perspective into this, and I guess from the environmental perspective, there's a mantra that uh, has connected the consumer movement, if you will, with what we're trying to do, which is the right to know. I would love to be able to see in 2020 a very informed um, consumer, if you will, population who would be able to look at their data and say, you know, I had no idea I was exposed to that or that that was in my water or that was in my food or, you know, that's what the associations were that were, were where I lived. Because that information actually puts into the consumer's hands the kinds of motivations that influence their communities, that can influence what they can tell their political representatives, and that has upstream and downstream uh, implications. So I, you know, I think that from an environmental point of view, this is a great opportunity for us to understand our uh, environmental exposure profile. Let me just follow up for a second. And do you think that when you give people back that environmental information, I think we sort of know, we have a lot of experience about um, variants of unknown significance from the genetic side. What do we know about people's reaction to, you've had a certain exposure, but we don't really know what that means. What Do we know sort of how that's received and interpreted? Um, I think people understand that uh, understanding environmental connections to disease is complicated and it takes some time. I think this initiative has the ability to uncover some relationships, just like through 23andMe, that were out of reach mm -hmm. before uh, on a scale that allow us to disentangle things that we had not been able to do before. So I think that it'll be a message of, well, we may not be able to tell you today but we may be able to tell you pretty soon, particularly if we take this um, simultaneous view and how we look at exposure information, disease, and work our way backwards in terms of uh, the life course. Okay. Josh? Yeah, um, I guess, so uh, most of my experience is sort of based upon how uh, consumers and new research participants use our technology. Um, we see the biggest usership when patients realize they can get something out of it personally, and then like what Ann said, they can you know, help the greater good. So uh, for us, it's always really important to you know, show them, listen, this thing can help you by you know, giving you real-time interventions, or in 23andMe, help you sort of uh, understand your genome and your risk factors, et cetera. But then also, uh, like Ann said, you know, put all that information in a greater data set. Um, you know, because you have this disease and it correlates with that gene, maybe others might have it too. Or for our technology, um, you know, a leading side effect for this drug is now this sort of treatment, so maybe we should put you on this additional medication. But uh, yeah, those two factors, personal benefit and then a greater good benefit. So it's like you talked about understanding causes of disease and, and also pr protective factors. So what, what do you think that people will get out of that in the short term? I think for, again, just focusing on heart attack, which is the leading cause of death in the U.S. and in the world, um, 
like to be able to say that we found a new protective mutation for this disease and that can inspire new medicines. And particularly, I think it'd be important to find this protective mutation in, in ways outside of cholesterol, lipids. And I think that's really the major unmet need right now. Can we actually find a non-lipid mechanism for reduction in MI risk? Um, and I think that this approach and the cohort and the genetics um, is, is the most promising way to get there. So I'm going to open this up for questions and comments from uh, folks in the room, and I see Bray and then Rasmi. Just a, this is a quick question for Anne. So can the uh, participants do their own queries, or do you have to be some type of certified researcher? Uh, so that we call that the armchair geneticist. We definitely want to enable um, um, consumers at some point. So we get a lot of consumer feedback. Um, from that, and that actually influences. I mean, just uh, even yesterday, there was a bunch of, anytime we see something popular in the media that's popping up, so things like the dress, that is when then the survey methodology team, they take those questions and then they think about how they can actually put it out. But that is the long term goal is that consumers would be able to actually ask those questions. And each disease group, in many ways, knows their own disease and what's interesting to them. So that's part of the reason why we have communities and we foster the communities and we take information from there and then we put that back to customers in the form of these quick questions. Uh, Vamsi Mutha, so I have a comment and one question. And the, the comment is I think, uh, especially Sake's talk and Anne's talk, I think really speak to the uh, remarkable uh, potential of reverse human genetics for very fundamental basic biological uh, discoveries. And I think as the committee tries to draft its recommendations and try to message this not only to the public but to the biomedical research community. I think it's, a, it's, it's important to remind everyone that there's going to be huge basic science payoffs from this initiative as well. Um, and I have one question for uh, Anne. And it seems like you already have a pretty remarkable uh, million person cohort. Uh, and just in the spirit of being a bit uh, provocative, could, what would you like to see coming out of the Precision Medicine Initiative and how could it be complementary to the remarkable work that you're already doing. So, um, you know, one, more data is always good. Um, uh, secondly, um, you know, 23andMe, we have a lot of our own objectives, what we're trying to do, and in some ways having this other cohort that is going to be very, you know, the, it's going to be run by the government, it's going to be very freely accessible to all researchers in the world is, is something I think that we're really eager then to promote because then we then feed that back to customers and really help them engage in what they're doing. The two things that I think, you know, when I think about the PMI initiative, we work with genetic information because it's easy, it's easier than everything else, but it's relatively easy to give back to customers and it's stable, it's, you know, we understand how to test for it. What is great for PMI is to think about the metabolome and, and, and microbiome and all of the other different ohms that are out there. And at some point, we want to enable the consumer to get all this once a lot of that has been worked out. So I'm eager for this whole test bed of, of PMI to actually work out a lot of that and define those technologies to the point where we're comfortable enough at 23andMe that we would then offer some of those as services to customers. Brenda Eskenazi, UC Berkeley. Um, I was very excited, Anne, by your presentation and thinking about the opportunities that are possible and listening to Howard as well. Have you gotten any information on environmental issues, environmental health, and if not, is there a way to get information, at least screening information, so then sub-studies could be done and would be important? Yeah, so I, I love the idea. We were just speaking right over here th about that. Um, I, we've been talking with environmental working group for a couple years about actually having either a blood test or a urine test to actually test for a huge number. I did something called the body burden study um, probably about five or six years ago where I was tested for 85 different chemicals. I was very high in fire retardants. It was the first thing they said. They said, you must fly a lot in coach. Um, because or you live in California. <laughs> yeah, well, there's California, and then they're, they're like, you must absorb a lot from, from in, you know, you don't absorb as much from leather as you do from, from fabric seats. Um, so it was a good argument for, for flying in business or first. Um, so those things, I think, are super interesting, and it's not that well said. And consumers really are passionate about that. So um, the challenge I had with body burden study is it was eight months, and it was $5,000. So being able to standardize, again, going back to the other question, if PMI is getting everything 
helping standardize the testing, getting the records, like the lab values, has a huge service for the entire industry, and we'd love to be part of that. Yeah, I think we, we could develop a screening questionnaire, and then you could do sub-studies from what you identify from that questionnaire. Completely, and we look at for things like Parkinson's even, because of the environment, and, and there's clearly associations with pesticides, we do have some of those surveys, but we'd be completely open to working with anyone now on exposures now. So I want to interject from some of the comments that have been coming in from Twitter. So um, one comment is um, uh, people are expressing their views about wanting their data, being able to get their data back, uh, and not being charged uh, to see the results. And I think one of the things that's going to be important, certainly NIH has been at the forefront of making sure that publications are um, accessible to the taxpayers who pay for the research that's published in those journals. And I think we'll have to pay attention to that as we move forward with the cohort. Another uh, tweet is that people want their genomic information, we're excited about our genome, uh, how can we engage participants in the story? And then um, from a sort of contrary point of view is uh, people expressing concerns about Big Brother um, having their information. And I think the, the notion of whether or not there's extra concern about uh, who is it that's holding um, the data is an important consideration. Do any, anybody on the panel have thoughts about those thoughts? Yeah, I can talk to that for sure because we spent, I mean, we spent a fair amount of time thinking about this because people, there's a little bit of the worry on big data and is the government going to own this, what they're going to do. Overwhelmed, when we've talked to customers, if they know where the data is going, they're comfortable with it and if they know how it's going to be used. So one thing we do with all the surveys when we're collecting phenotype data, instead of just dumping your whole EMR on people and you don't know how it's going to be used, by collecting phenotype data through the surveys, you get to choose do you actually want to participate or not? So for instance, we had a very large, uh, uh, we had a sexual orientation study, and people then could choose, do they want to participate in that research or do they not? But if it's just in my medical record, then is everything being used and do I know exactly what's in my medical record? So it was one advantage of actually having the self-report survey data is you can elect, I want to give you this information or I don't want to participate in that specific study. One other thing just on this, you want to be able to withdraw. It's something that's important for customers. When they're upset, if they see something that PMI is doing that they don't agree with, being able to withdraw your data is important. And it's one of the things I feel like that's critical for 23andMe is it keeps us always honest because we have a true relationship with customers. If we're doing something that they don't agree with, they will withdraw their data or withdraw their consent for research. And that's cr that would destroy us. So we have to always have a positive relationship with our customers and listen to them. Well, and one of the things with the cohort, too, is that we're going to be engaging with people, as you do and many cohorts do, over extended periods of time. And if we're going to be collecting real-world exposure data and lifestyle information and, and patient-reported, participant-reported information, there's going to be times when participants want to take a break. And we're going to have to be able to figure out how to work that in so that people can, you know, I still want to be a participant, but I'm going to take a break right now because there's other stuff going on in my life. So we're going to have to be able to, to accommodate that oh, quickly. A question. Most, most, a question. Most, fascinate, most fascinating uh, presentation here. I would, th with this regard, I would like to make uh, a few, few comments. So I'm, I'm, I'm going to restrict you to about 30 seconds. Okay. okay. Uh, but if that is the case. Then, the, from a perspective of both the uh, sake and um, um, of all the, uh, how do you all the all the diseases in, in many cases, phenotype, genotype, and diseases, and uh, also the um, uh, the epigenetic variation, all of them are correlated and work as modular aspects. So, if that is the case, how can we look at individual diseases or individual symptoms as um, as independent events? How do Thank we do you. that? Um, that's a great question. I think as Andre pointed out yesterday, the, uh, there are going to be unexpected relationships between diseases, and this is actually one of the ways, this, this kind of national cohort would be one of the ways to discover those unexpected relationships, uh, whether they be just disease to disease correlation or due to a, a genotype that has multiple, uh, multiple effects. And so I think, um, I think it's currently an unknown as to the pattern, the full spec, the full pattern of interrelationships, and certainly using the CMS data, he uncovered all these relationships that pre previously were uh, not suspected. So I think um, this cohort could really unravel a lot of additional ones. Thanks. Thanks, um, Howard. I'm going to jump in with a question before we go to Mike. 
you know, we talked, there was the idea put forward yesterday about um, smaller um, cohorts sort of building up to, a newer, to larger uh, cohorts and trying out things in smaller groups of individuals. In thinking about what you would want to measure in terms of the exposome, do you have sort of a short list of the things that you would, would be sort of on the top of your list as things that you would want to test measuring in the very short term? What would be the sort of top hit list? Um, before I answer that, I do have to backtrack a little bit to the comment you made about the, uh, the um, tweets. Um, okay. There's two aspects of public health that are critical that haven't been talked about yet here. One of them is that it, it's true that consumers can say, well, I just don't want to participate. I don't want to be involved in this. But um, the other aspect to this uh, is the governance of the, of the actual study. I think if public health has learned a lesson, it's about the involvement of community-based participation in identifying the research questions uh, and how the information is used. And unless you pay attention to that, it's messy. It's democracy. But unless you pay attention to that, this could go off the rails and people will say, you know, this is really about something other than what we're interested in. The second is that there are consumers who will sign up for 23andMe, but there are consumers who say, you know, I have a history of having my genetic information used in bad ways. And public health is also about those marginalized populations for which the health inequities are greatest. Uh, it's actually the American indigenous population that had the worst experience with research in this country. And if you can't get them involved in the PMI, we will have failed in our mission in actually protecting the health of Americans. So that was just the second point I wanted to make. In terms of a hit list, um, you know, uh, flame returns is a big one uh, because, in fact, uh, there's a whole list of things that we're worried about in terms of endocrine disruptors. Of course, there's metals and other classes of things, and I'm sure Linda, the director of NIEHS, will have an opinion on that as well. Great. Thanks. So, so in terms of understanding um, what different segments of the population are going to, how they're going to view the Precision Medicine Initiative and what kinds of things we'll need to do in order to enhance their engagement. Our um, third workshop is going to focus on participant and community engagement. And in preparation for that, the foundation for the NIH is about to field a large uh, survey of uh, Americans, specifically oversampling uh, medically underserved and uh, ethnic and racial diverse, uh, diverse populations. And so I'm hoping from that that we'll be able to have some real input into helping us define how do we get to those populations and um, what is uh, sort of um, providing optimism and, and maybe uh, uh, trepidation for those, those groups. Mike Lauer. Um, Sec, I'm trying to, uh, uh, let me ask you this. Are you imagining a large collection of Mendelian randomization studies and the outcome uh, over, say, the next uh, few years would be a list of potentially high-yield drug targets. Is that your vision for this? One aspect of the vision, yes. I, I think that, that actually in the near term, those are very possible um, with, with this cohort because of the idea of having a large number of individuals with genotype, with biomarkers, and yesterday there was a lot of enthusiasm for metabolites measurable in the blood, and disease status. And so with those three, you can actually systematically evaluate using this approach, whether there's genetic evidence that the biomarker is causal or not, in, in analogous fashion, you can actually use the approach to find uh, genes that where you may want to intervene in terms of drug, drug targets. Great. Thanks. So to follow on to that, um, in thinking about short-term versus long-term, uh, long-term, you can think about finding predictive biomarkers of future disease, right. and that requires having people who do not have the disease at inception. And since this is the panel on short-term uh, uh, returns, what are your thoughts about uh, ascertaining people who are, you know, what should be the focus of the recruitment strategy? And you touched on this uh, briefly, but I'm interested in your expanded thoughts on whether we should just sample healthy people today or a, a, a general cohort versus trying to target uh, populations that include people who have prevalent disease today. Yeah, I gave you my bias on that last slide, which is uh, I think there's potentially a role for both, that basically you do assemble a population-based reference sample that you're going to follow longitudinally for incident disease, and you also will have prevalent disease in those, in those individuals that you can take advantage of. 
But I actually think there may be a, an important role for systematically thinking about a group of diseases that you want to go after that are, that, you know, any number of criteria under un, not large unmet medical need and so forth that really, and, and, and select individuals. Um, and so essentially kind of disease-based registries as the other circles on the right that I showed in my figure. Because I actually think that actually would potentially provide an opportunity for tremendous patient engagement because there are disease-based communities for any number of, large number of diseases that you could readily tap into. And, and you've done this for the Parkinson's in terms of being able to recruit a, a large number of individuals from within your, your collection uh, mm -hmm. uh, for subsequent in-depth mm -hmm. analysis. And so I, I think that model of a population-based reference sample with a set of disease-based entities might work well. Just to ask Anne a related question, what fraction of participants in 23andMe do you estimate come in because of a particular disease condition and uh, that's what's driven their interest versus people who are just more broadly interested in uh, the idea? So I would say roughly half of our customers come in for ancestry, um, especially today because we're not returning health information, um, but it was probably 60-40 even before then. But ancestry is really interesting, and it's also one of the things that helps us get trios because you want to build out your whole family. Um, people, the number one search term on 23andMe's health when we first launched was for APOE. So people want to know their Alzheimer's risk. Uh, BRCA is also of huge interest to customers. So people frequently come and they have questions in their mind. They want to know, is there a family history of X? Um, those two have definitely been top list, but a lot of, um, there's definitely a general, you know, I'd probably say, you know, 10, 20 percent of customers are just sort of that general interest, um, but clearly they have a reason for coming. The thing, the one thing that's interesting is people frequently talk about should we recruit healthy or sick people? Um, and I, as we look at our data, one of our, our statistical geneticists came and said, he's like, look, no, one, no one's clean. You know, no one's totally healthy. Everyone has something. So everyone's interesting to study for one reason or another. Um, and so it's been one of the advantages we've had of having this sort of all-comers database is that everyone has actually ended up being interesting. So let me t tell you what we've got in terms of order here. Um, Linda Birnbaum, Sachin, Mike Gaziano, Richard Platt, Esteban Gonzalez, and then we're going to take a 15-minute break. Linda Birnbaum, NIEHS. So I have a comment and a question. First of all, really an answer for you, Kathy, and, and I think Howard referred to it. When you talk about exposomics, that's really the totality of exposure, and certainly metabolomics is part of exposomics, but when you do exposomics, you would also be looking for exogenous small molecules right. and, and some large molecules that you can pick up. If you want to do standard biomonitoring, where you look for things that's kind of looking under the lamppost, and you can look at hundreds of different environmental chemicals plus all the small metabolites, and you can look for patterns and associations with different kinds of health status, and that's being done. And leads to alone you do the agnostic kind of looking, you end up with a lot of hypotheses which are currently being studied. But my, my question is really for Anne, and that's 23andMe, which is kind of, I think, a selected population. In other words, people have to pay to join. Um, so I was wondering how generalizable do you think that the information you're getting from your 23andMe cohort. Um, I would assume that there are some of the subgroups within it that may be relatively generalizable. Mm -hmm. uh, without a doubt, I mean, we've, um, and we get this question a lot, is, is this just sort of this extreme, you know, young, um, you know, educated community? And I almost put up the demographic slide. Um, it's actually more diverse than people would expect. Um, the age, um, the peak age is in the 40s, but we have a pretty diverse cohort, like we have a whole community of people over 100 in the database. Um, so I think that, you know, in part because of the ancestry, um, we recruit people from all over. We have done studies now for the FDA getting people in the middle of the country who have no education background in, in sciences and taking the test filling out surveys about their comprehension and things like residual risk. Can they understand residual risk? And we have over 90% comprehension. So it does give that sense. People can understand this information. Um, when you give away the kit for free, people are less engaged. It is one of the things that's interesting is people want to feel that there's some kind of stake in it. Um, that said, we have a number of disease communities we've recruited. We provide free kits for people with Parkinson's disease, myeloproliferative neoplasm, sarcoma, 
um, inflammatory bowel disease. We're now launching uh, bipolar uh, and others. All of those, sorry, <laughs> all of those are super engaged because people want to know about their disease. And we send out quarterly newsletters. You have to actually engage them and, and keep them engaged. We're going to move on. We're going to keep moving. We're moving. Yeah. We're moving. Gotcha. <laughs> So as we think about the near-term scenarios, uh, I'm trying to figure out between 23andMe's experience and uh, uh, from sex experience, you've got a heterogeneous data set. What is enough to be of value in the next two to five years? So what, have, what are the data sets that you said, you know what, these patients, despite us having their genome, I can't do anything meaningful with them. So what is that minimal viable product from a data set from your perspective? Uh, and and I think and from a reality what you've dealt with and, and sec from uh, as uh, someone who's going to be trying to process it. Okay, and 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 super super short answer. Yeah, um, you know it was w once we got to a hundred thousand people you could really do a lot. Um, recruiting can be incredibly fast. Like we launched ten thousand free kits for African Americans and we recruited almost overnight. I don't mean size. I mean yeah. what's in the data set. So is, it, is the genome just enough, or do you have to have that health survey? You have to have the health survey. Genotypes, 100,000. Mm -hmm. uh, Mike. Oh, uh, you know, I completely agree with the panel on the engagement aspect, and, 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 the, and I think it's critical. And, that, and uh, we, in our partnership, it's out of altruism, but we do want investment. We require that they invest 20 minutes in a questionnaire and 40 minutes uh, in, a, uh, in a later questionnaire, and we get about 75% of those back in the second round. So there, there, there is some investment, but it's not, some of them pay to, to come. So um, very, very, um, very quickly, and just really, the, I, I can't agree with you more that the, um, the self-reporting information is, is vital, is critical, and we spent a year designing our, our instruments, and we have a lot to learn, and I know there's engagement in how we can s stay in touch, but, but the cautionary note is that sometimes the information they give you is wrong mm -hmm. um, on self-report. And so is, are there ways to augment 23andMe with, um, with uh, administrative clinical health data in, in some other way, or is it solely based on the self-reporting of information? Uh, right now, it is solely based on self-report information. We find when we're not replicating a known GWAS hit, we go back and we revise our questions. So things like celiac disease, if we just ask, everyone now thinks that they have celiac disease. Mm -hmm. But it's only the people who have actually gone in and had some kind of intervention and had it confirmed by a gastroenterologist. Once we screen, cut down the data, that then replicated the hits. So we would love, again, one of the things I would love for PMI to do is to actually get EMR data and get the lab data, or more importantly, the drug history, enable drug history to go to the consumer, because right now it's just bottlenecked. Right. Yeah, and that's going to be the topic of our next workshop on EMRs. And um, uh, Go ahead, Richard. Uh, so I'm following up Rick Lifton's question about recruiting the cohort. Do you see, uh, do you see advantage to selectively ident identifying some people who are known to have uh, have had successful treatment and compare them with people who have failed tr the same treatments? Yeah, I think, I think the idea of, you know, trying to identify, you know, elite responders for a given drug or, or non-responders, I mean, that actually is doable uh, or is, is an interesting thing to pr propose. The question, I think, about specific uh, recruitment on a given drug and so forth, that would, I think, would really depend on the scientific question and how much you know, how, how widely the drug is used and so forth. But you could do those kind of studies within just a large data set as well. Yeah. Well, well, a, a, million, a million doesn't take you very far if that's what you're looking for. So well, I'm, I'm just interested in your sense of the value of having those discordant pairs because you, you could easily enrich for that if you wanted to. And so my question is how much effort should go into that kind of I think it would really depend on the specific drug and the specific scientific question in terms of kind of, this would be really potentially a one-off in, in a large study and it would have to be a very high value to really prioritize this scientific question over, you know, many other ones that are competing with it, I think. Um, Esteban, I think you have the last question. Great. Uh, Esteban from UCSF. <coughs> and nice job. Um, one of the things that you, you have is you displayed how nimble you can be with the living, breathing cohort. But what I hope you could do is share with the committee your experience of how you guys got out of your offices and actually got into the community and did work. Because I know overnight you did recruit like 10,000 individ African-American individuals. So how did you, can you share with us how you did all that and how generalizable your data set is? So we have a social media team. We have a marketing team that does this research. Um, 
a little bit of is trial and fail. You know, we've, it's never happened before. So things like we ran um, a magazine ad in Ebony and we could see based on what the number, you know, where people said that they've heard about the free kits, where they came in from. So I would say one of the things that the Valley, Silicon Valley is really good at is accepting failure and saying you just move on. So you launch, you try something, it doesn't work. So in Sarcoma, we first launched a community, it didn't work. And then we partnered with George Dimitri at Harvard. He you know, helped us contact a bunch of individuals and suddenly we had a, a fabulous sarcoma community. So for each community, you need to have that ability and that willingness, that acceptance, that you're gonna have to try and fail and not the same thing works for each type of community. Great, thank you. I wanna um, thank the panelists and thank all of you for great questions. We are going to take a break now for 15 minutes and then Sachin is going to reconvene us uh, promptly at 10.30 for the next panel. So join me in thanking the panel. Uh, I'm Sachin Ketterpaul from the University of Michigan, uh, and I've been asked to moderate the long-term scenarios. Uh, this is, I think, uh, an exciting piece because we don't have to be constrained as much by reality as we have been for the last day or so. And the exciting piece of this is that we can consider either computational, regulatory, or data access options that really transcend what we can do for the next year or two. The speakers for today have been asked to speak regarding scenarios that range uh, 10 to 20 years out. And that certainly involves the possibilities for having a different regulatory framework, a different set of relationships with the, the patients and the participants in this entity, and to allow us to transition from one of those definitions to the other. Um, the, the first speaker will be Zach Kohane, who uh, many of you know very well uh, from Harvard, uh, the founder and creator of I2B2, a platform for collaboration which has been used across 100 academic medical centers and probably in every single one represented here today. Thank you very much, Zach. Thank you very much. Is this on? It's on, and, and since we've got the, we're the last set before lunch, I want to take Kathy's, you know, points and do something a moderator once did. 20 bucks for whoever gets closest to the 10 minute allotted time, 10 bucks for whoever second, and whoever is longest owes me a coffee at lunch. All right? Deal. Let's go. Deal. Start, <laughs> start the clock now. Okay. To go forward? Uh, yeah, all right, fine. All right, so this is uh, precision punditry. Um, I was asked to, uh, as many of you, to uh, think uh, broadly and a little bit more uh, long range. I've learned a lot today. Um, I, uh, I don't know if those of you who caught it, but uh, apparently ISIS is doing good things in Canada. <laughs> yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. All right. Um, so, I would like to say that, um, I'm gonna make, I think, eight slides. So, uh, I'm uh, involved in a project called the Undiagnosed Disease Network, which is a center which does the following. It takes patients and does this miraculous thing. It takes patients, um, takes their whole medical history, and then takes their whole genome and makes that follow the patients to the best doctor who best suits them in across seven renowned academic health centers throughout the country. So that leads me to my T plus three, uh, three years from now um, uh, prediction. Getting the right provider. How hard is it to find the right doctor who knows about you? With all your clinical data, how often does all your clinical data come with you? with your expert, expertly interpreted genome. Well, that doesn't happen at all. I am predicting in three years, you will see the first precision medicine clinics that, does, that do just that. Next, T plus five years. Uh, I got a kind introduction talking about our I2B2 network that um, allows you to create networks of networks, uh, as we described in the recent uh, Nature Biotech paper. And this al allows us to do, to create um, large studies just in time across literally millions of patients. 
We did, for example, the largest comorbidity study of autism and identified three different subclasses of kids with autism that if you looked at your genomics, you would never know. You had to have an electronic medical record. You, we were able to show that there was a subgroup with infections and autoimmune disease, a subgroup with seizures, and a, yet another subgroup with mostly, mostly psychiatric disease. And so that leads me to T plus five years. Here is something that many of us in medicine would scoff at, but in fact, we would love if we were patients. This tells you what movies you will see if you like another movie. Who does this? It's called a company called Netflix. And they will tell you based on your past purchase history, not only what you are likely to purchase, but based on other patients, excuse me, consumers like you, what, which movies you're most likely to get. Wouldn't that be a novel thought? A doctor would know your entire history and they'd know the history of all the patients like you, not the ones they just remembered in the clinic, but all the patients in the United States like you. Do we do that now? No. So would it be a good thing to be as good as Netflix? Yes, it would be a good thing. Are we there yet now? No. And look what they do. They, have, they, look, they score, sort, filter bags of movies for presentation. They look at titles in context and objective maximize consumption enjoyment. Wouldn't it be great to be able to maximize health and enjoyment? When I, we talk about Netflix, people are, you know, go uh, highbrow on me. I think it would be a step up. So my prediction is phase one, Netflix style, patients, uh, precision medicine, patients like you, plus five years. 45th, uh, no, eight years ago, I wrote an article in Science that attracted a lot of uh, ire, actually, um, where I said, you know, let's not stop having this uh, mutual ignorance pack between patients and uh, s scientists, where the patients don't know anything about their results, and the doctors don't know who the patients are, the researchers don't know who the patients are. Can we create a system which allows the data to be obtained? And then the patient gets, to, gets an update of the most relevant results. So I wrote this eight years ago. And I remember at the time some colleagues on Broad saying this was extremely unsafe. I was breaching the boundaries between research and, and, and the clinic. And so why do I say T plus five years? Because one could argue that Anne just showed us that it's T zero that we're doing it today. And I'll t tell you why we're not. So Anne's doing beautiful things. But here is what we're missing. In the end, it might just be the 23 and model. But in 2007, I proposed that we actually have a one last hurrah where we actually involve the healthcare system. And the last hurrah is that we actually have all the data from the health records, be unified with that patient data. Cryptographically, the patients get updates that they have tuned to. They can tune to the psych channel, the cancer channel, all channels. They can be reconsented, re-recruited. That was all described in that article. But the question was, I suppose, is it going to be part of the healthcare system or not? And answering is great success outside the healthcare system. It still remains to be seen. And so my prediction, my hopeful prediction, is that maybe at T plus five, we'll see the informed cohort, as I called it then, uh, coming to, to be. This is an article from BMJ, of, among many, showing how doctors receive tens of thousands of dollars to recruit patients. Is there a conflict of interest here? I want you to participate in this trial. That'll be good for you. And I'm going to get $10,000 a year per patient, or sometimes $20,000 a year. Is that ethical or right? I don't hear a big hubbub about that. Which IRB got conniptions around that? Nobody did. So my prediction for T plus five years is that patients are going to be able to monetize for themselves their participation. And they're contributing their data. They will be paid for it. And we'll have another company where they pay patients in micropayments for use of their data and big payments for recruitment and trials. And I can see a lot of you getting snooty on me and saying, Zach, what's the, eth what's the ethical... Uh, uh, challenge of getting patients 
uh, paid. Excuse me? That's their life. They're getting paid. It's far more unethical, the state we have now, when the doctors are getting paid large amounts, the healthcare institutions are getting large, a large amount, and they're totally conflicted, and we don't talk about it. So pay the patient physician is my next T plus five uh, years predict prediction. So what we're hearing a lot about is we have a big pie of disease. Let's say familial malignancy. And through a classical or new age uh, genomic test, we find, shown in blue, some mutation that is associated causally with this um, familial malignancy. Not only that, using reverse genetics, we can come up with a drug to treat it. And guess what happens? We have a $100,000 a year drug. I'm happy, you're happy, the patients are happy. But what if we actually look at familial malignancy and we start decomposing it into precisely, this is our goal, precisely all the constituent uh, genotypes that actually cause this, each with its own precise medicine. Are we going to be able to charge $100,000 a year per patient for all the familial malignancies? I think the answer is going to be no. And I think when we, it is a foreseeable zero-sum game that even if we double the price, the, double the share of healthcare, the dev, double the share of the GNP that is paid for by healthcare, of necessity, the dollar per year per patient will no longer be sustainable at the current level. We're seeing it now with the, with the hepatitis C drugs, which, are, which if fully used in the, uh, uh, in the appropriate population, would cause an 8% increase in Medicare. So we know even if we double the budget, there's only in the end a finite resource, so the per patient cost is not going to end up in the current five, six figure range it is. What will that create for business opportunities? I let uh, you uh, contemplate. So precision medicine markets and the market forecasting through precision medicine is my next T plus 10 years forecast. Here's another T plus 10 years. Here's a family tree, a family tree of, um, shown in here, it's shown in uh, pink, individuals with Alzheimer's. So this is an individual here at the bottom, do I have a cursor, yes I do, um, who has a family tree with a, uh, these uh, three women that have um, Alzheimer's disease. And then, and then, if I'm Robert Greene, maybe, I get a APOE test and I find, ooh, APOE4, high risk of Alzheimer's, and I got a family history, man, am I worried. But what if I had, that's odd, that's a, that's a PC Mac thing, but what's shown here would have previously been fibroblasts. If I had fibroblasts for each of these individuals, and I could actually sequence them and find they don't have APOE4. Now, what do I think? Maybe there is a risk for Alzheimer's, but it doesn't seem to be related to through APOE4. Those individuals do not have APOE4 variants. So this mechanism is not through APOE4. So we, we're evolving, uh, uh, <coughs> looking for another mechanism and suddenly avoiding a false positive or what I called with my colleague Russ Altman, who I understand was here yesterday, the incidental ohm, by the way, the biggest ohm of them all. So what I'm claiming in T plus 10 years is the family biohistory bank, where you will have for each of your family members not only uh, DNA bank, but actually fibroblasts so that um, even after they're passed away, you could do some um, in a dish um, either on organoids or on single cells, uh, pharmacological experimentation prior uh, to treating the live person. So the family biohistory biobank is my another T plus 10 year prediction. You want precision medicine? Here's some precision medicine. Just using healthcare system data. Very blue collar healthcare system data. This is work done by Griffin Weber in a few of our uh, famous hospitals. And what you see here on the, uh, um, on the um, large blue lines going across screen 
are percentiles of the number of facts. This is the stupidest thing ever. It's the number of facts that we have about you. 95th percentile, 5th percentile of facts. People that we have a lot of facts about, people we don't have a lot of facts about. And here is your likelihood at every given age of dying in the next three years. And we're able to predict this individual with the 95th percentile for facts has a 50% chance of being dead in the next three years. And that's only using the number of facts. When we start actually using our medical brains and c conditioning this on other diagnostic categories, we beat with odds ratios any genetic test. Any genetic test. Now that's just using our data today. Some people call it the death of insurance. I call it precision insurance. So I see a new insurance coming out. It'll be a new market. It'll be a precision market. It'll be a stratified market. It may not have the same social justice that you want, but unless we do something different, that's my prediction for T plus 10 years. Last story. This individual. Yes, this individual. This was at an uh, undiagnosed uh, disease network meeting. This individual is a computer scientist. This individual is a computer scientist. He does not know biology. His son was born when he mo just moved to Salt Lake City, and he was looked very odd when he was born. Did not have good muscle tone. Was mi misdiagnosed by a lot of prominent geneticists w with particular diseases that ultimately he was found not to have. Then using a social work network, he climbed to the right gripping point, which was Duke, where uh, Goldstein's group did exome sequencing on him. And they found his mutation, a unique mutation found to be causal NLGY1. Did the maximal treatment on this child. Turned out this child was having 100 seizures a day. And they did maximal medical treatment on him. And they got him down to seven seizures a day. I don't know. I would, I would have to change my diapers if my kid was having one seizure a year. And Matt was thinking coherently while having this happen. Not only, did he do, not only did he do that, but he looked at the biology of this. And using the big data resources we have, what did we know about the function of this gene and how it interacted with glycosylation and which moieties of which um, um, peptidoglycan was cleaved in a different way? And he came up with a hypothesis that he ran by a few people that seemed plausible, that there was insufficiency of a particular monosaccharide, a simple sugar, that was uh, not uh, available at the synapse. And so he went to this really big FDA-like thing called, uh, oh, it's called over-the-counter, and, um, and he got it to his child. There's no more seizures. And the EG is almost normalized. So I want you to think about that. How many doctors do you know who've helped diagnose a disease, create a new diagnostic category. Very few. A few of them are in this room, but there are very few. How many of them do you know who have actually helped cure a disease? Very few of those. How many have done both? He has. He's not a doctor. He's not a geneticist. But he used all the data that we have. So my prediction is T plus 15 years with a little help from the Precision Medicine Initiative, and I'm glad to not use my $10 that you owe me, buddy, um, <laughs> to discuss it further, we can all be as effective as Matt might. That is my T plus 15 years uh, goal. And then we can all be unique with a positive outlook, even in the face of these terrible uh, diseases. So thank you, and I want to give a quick shout out to our conference free at Harvard, June 24th, 25th. Matt Might is keynoting. Come and register. The seats, and I kid you not, these free seats are actually going fast. Thank you very much. Next up, we've got uh, Jennifer Malin from Anthem. And Jennifer is the Vice President of Clinical Strategy there. She's a medical oncologist by training and practice as well. 
and uh, she'll be offering us a very unique perspective there, I think, as someone who's on both sides of what we've historically called a divide, but I think we need to start calling a partnership. Thank you all for having me here today. So it's been a really enlightening workshop. It's advanced, it's just. So I've, I've gone old school. I do the keyboard. Oh, uh, that's, <laughs> okay. Okay, I'll, I'll, I'll okay. <laughs> so um, I'm a, a health services researcher also by background. So I um, have an, a natural tendency to look at the ecosystem and so what I want us to, um, to think about today is an envision a world um, 20 years from now where um, whole genomic sequencing data is readily available and how are we going to use that in clinical practice. And so these are um, some use cases I think of kind of fairly common scenarios in the healthcare system and how, um, how might they change if we had this incredible resource available and what would be required in the environment to actually make it um, accessible and, and usable within the healthcare system um, today, well not as we have it today, how would we have to transform the healthcare system to get there. Um, I highly recommend this book actually if you haven't read it, this quote from Ron Adner, it is no longer enough to manage your innovation, you must now manage your innovation ecosystem. Um, and it's really fascinating, he describes a number of innovations that um, really failed because the, the whole environment wasn't considered. So the first one, as, as um, Sasha mentioned, I'm a medical oncologist and I think, you know, in many, in many ways we think of, of cancer therapy as being one of the first areas that's going to be able to benefit from precision medicine. And so I just want to um, think through or, or talk you through what I think is going to be necessary to really even be able to use it effectively. In, um, in cancer therapy. So on the left here you have what, what's a classic pathology report today. And this has actually been a major advance over the last 10 years or so, whereas this is considered synaptic re um, reporting, synoptic reporting, because um, in the past it was, you know, pathologists would just give you a free form text summary of what they saw through the microscope and the testing they did, and you'd have to read through this free text and try to interpret what they were saying, you know, was it positive, negative, what was the relevant information. So, and you couldn't necessarily tell if they hadn't done it, you know, if a test was negative, they might not even necessarily mention that they'd done it. So with synoptic reporting, you now fortunately get all the information, but it comes in this long form, and this is an example from a breast cancer patient, and you can see that we have the relevant biomarkers which allow us to, to tailor therapy fairly accurately at this point in breast cancer, which includes estrogen receptor, progesterone receptor, HER2 status, and then other features of the tumor. Um, and I, I think, you know, breast cancer kind of puts us at our limit in terms of how many different um, genetic and um, biological variables I think as clinicians we're really able to handle in our mind. It's hard to imagine what it's going to be like when there's, you know, for these diseases when you're trying to um, figure out therapy for, for, you know, five to ten different genetic mutations that are happening simultaneously once we're able to measure that. So what will we need to be able to use that, this data in the clinic? Um, and so I've kind of imagined here um, on the computer screen is, is an interactive pathology report. So instead of a static document, you can now click on the different links. And, and none of this is technology really that, you know, we all expect to use this in the rest of our lives, but somehow it hasn't really made it to the bedside yet. So you would be able to not only um, interact with the pathology report so you, you wouldn't have this dense information, but you could drill into the different um, mutations and, and diagnostic information that was pertinent. Um, learn about it, link it to clinical trials, and then also really have decision support embedded that would be linked to the PATH report that it would, al would that allow the clinician to understand, you know, with these three um, genetic mutations together, what treatment is going to be best for this patient because it's really not going to be possible to, to keep all those variables in mind simultaneously. Um, and then the next thing I think, and there's been a, a number of, of Institute of Medicine and other groups who have 
uh, who have been focusing on the learning healthcare system. But I think this really brings up why this is going to be so important that we be able to capture the outcomes of what happens to this individual patient and, and be able to feed it back into, an, into a, a learning healthcare system. Because even with doing um, well designed clinical trials with heterogeneous populations and having registries as they're being designed today to try to understand how these different um, therapies will impact these genetic mutations, uh, they, uh, in, impact tumors with these different mutations. You can envision in a world 20 years from now when we have all sorts of other therapies that are also taking advantage of the um, genetic information for other diseases. And so it's going to be impossible to really determine in a clinical trial how all those things really interact. So we're going to need to capture this data over time as we um, um, take the, translate the research to the bedside, but then um, be able to identify why it is or isn't working now in individual patients. Um, the second use case I have is for DVT prophylaxis. And um, DVTs are, are um, thrombotic clots that happen in the legs that are very common um, in after surgeries. They can also occur commonly in, in patients or individuals who um, are sedentary. You know, sometimes you hear about them on long haul plane flights. And there's, an, there's a number of environmental factors as well as genetic factors that impact um, individuals' likelihood of developing these clots. We don't really know very much about the complex genetic factors that um, impact most of these routine clots. The, the ones that we know a lot about are the ones that um, where individuals develop lots and lots of clots over a short period of time. But we can envision that in 20 years we'll have this information and we'll be able to tailor therapy when someone comes into the hospital. Five years, you think? You think it's going to be there in five years? Okay, so I'm being pessimistic. Um, but you know, on the left, again, is, is the way we determine how to um, order DVT prophylaxis today in the hospital. And so, um, and this, again, is a major advance from just 10 years ago, um, where basically you would write an order on paper and you would just say sub-Q heparin. And there were no, you know, there was no thought process necessarily into who got it. It was based on, you know, your clinical judgment. So now this template, which I know is a little hard to hear, allows you to go through and pick out the risk factors that you know about in this, in this patient and then come up with a recommendation based on the, the family history and the, the different personal medical history factors that this individual has. But envision that in you know, five, 10 years, whenever, we're going to know um, about the genetic risk profile that, and can individualize this using people's genetic data. So we'll need access, whichever hospital this person goes to for their surgery, that hospital is going to need real-time access to their genomic data stored somewhere to be able to impl um, import that into this algorithm to determine the most appropriate prophylaxis for the procedure that they're about to undergo. Um, similarly, um, for side effect profiles, Im imagine a world where instead of um, pulling up online or, or you know, this is a, a copy of um, the FDA label insert, where instead of just reading generic um, percentages, you know, 10 percent patients taking this drug develop nausea, you know, 2 percent have a, have a myocardial infarction, whatever the generic risk is, um, imagine that that the information is fed through a database that now um, layers on the different genomic alterations that impact which side effects. So it's your pharmacogenomic profile applied to the to potential side effects of a drug. So instead of just looking at a laundry list, when you go to the pharmacy to pick up your medications, the pharmacist is able to review your personalized drug risk profile with you. And again, to be able to do that, the pharmacist would have to have access to your genomic profile and be able to link it up to an annotated database that had information about the drug that you were about to receive so that that information could then be tailored to you. Um, and then lastly, thinking about what is the world of preventive health care going to look like 
when we all have this information available to us. And so you think about in today's world, we go to our primary care provider, they look up, they look at our age and they say, okay, you know, you're 50 years old, it's time for your colonoscopy. There's some checklists of things that we're supposed to do. And, you know, and the reality is for the most part, the annual checkup has been shown to not really be of much value. It's actually on the choosing wisely list of things that you shouldn't do anymore. So how could we, how will we reinvent this when um, we have the tools of precision medicine? And is it really even gonna be, is your primary care provider, the doctor that you go to when you're sick, gonna be the best person to, to do this um, and to interpret the genetic information and to be able to coach you and motivate you to change? It's not the training that we go to medical school to get. So, you know, in thinking about this, and this is just one example, I'm sure there are numerous others, it seemed like maybe we shouldn't be going, when we have our genetic data available to us, it, we shouldn't be going to our PCP every year for our annual checkup, but we should be going to a preventive genetics counselor who's also a health coach, who can interpret our genetic information for us, but also is trained in, you know, in all sorts of um, nutrition, behaviors, and has the, um, the skill set to coach and motivate us to actually change our behavior and, and try to um, mitigate whatever risk factors are mutable. So um, I, I, this is, I'm sure, just scratching the surface, I'm just starting to think about this exciting area. But um, you know, I think it highlights in the, in the number of ways that we're going to need to think about how to transform the healthcare system to make maximal use of this exciting information. So um, some of the things just pulled from these um, anecdotes will need a secure repository of individuals, patients, whole genomic data that can really be accessed from all points of service across the healthcare system, electronic health records, pharmacy, primary care. We'll need dynamic reporting tools to communicate the results of genomic testing and decision support tools because it's once we have all of this complex data, it's going to be um, too much for individual clinicians, even who are very, very expert in their field, to be able to interpret simultaneously. These, um, while individuals' genes don't change, the information that we have, um, I think that Anne showed very nicely about the, the real time that 23andMe is doing to update this information, but we'll need annotated databases that are updated that can be accessed as well so that whether you're using the genetic information for pharmacogenomic purposes and to understand in prescribing this drug what's the potential impact, that that information is, is available across the healthcare continuum. And then finally, we'll need to think about new clinical roles and what the skill sets are and how we're going to train those individuals to be able to communicate genetic information and motivate individuals to pursue preventive health strategies. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, having personally done chest compressions for an hour during a massive intraoperative PE, the DVT <laughs> example was uh, quite uh, illustrative. Uh, next up, uh, excited to have uh, Brenda Eskenazi from uh, uh, Berkeley, who will be speaking to us, I think, regarding a provocative topic given her background uh, with children uh, and uh, pregnant women as an area of focus for her. And I, I, I'm really excited to see uh, how she's going to make us uh, think a little bit differently than what we've been doing maybe for the last couple months on this topic. I'm leaving right afterwards, so I'm not going to be able to get you the cup of coffee. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So, whoops, wrong. It's okay. So I had to think about what our real long-term goals were for PMI. And to me, it's to optimize health and well-being across the lifespan and to eliminate health disparities so that populations and communities can reach their optimal health. So. I come from a life course background. I'm a developmental psychologist originally and work with children. So I think about the fact that today's experience influenced tomorrow's health and also the next generation's health. 
that the development of health over a lifetime is interactive with genes, environment, and by environment I mean broadly defined of biologic, physical, social, nutritional, chemical, and also human behavior. And that health trajectories can be affected by exposure during critical, sensitive, developmental windows. So many of us in our field pur uh, purport to belong to the developmental origins of health origins um, theories. And we follow the work of David Barker, who said that the influence of many exposures on adult health is really based on exposures that occur in the first 1,000 days of life. And again, by exposures, I don't mean just chemical exposures, but nutritional and behavioral. And there's now a growing body of data that actually can back up his theory, which shows that early life exposures are linked to adult onset disease, so that there's a very important window of susceptibility. So I'm going to make a number of points in this talk, I'm, I'm five points to be precise, and this is the one of the major points. The other thing is that we're now learning that it's not just studying pregnant women today and their children, but also the multi-generational effects. We have evidence now in rodents and even in human that it's what the grandmother was exposed to that has influence on the children and the grandchildren. So my first very important point is that there are very few multi-generational studies in the United States. In fact, I could only think of one with biological markers. Um, and that means that we're really limited as to what we can look at. So my first point is that the prenatal period and early postnatal periods are very important. And if we don't look at those periods, we're going to miss an important, po point, important time of sensitivity that we need to get information on parents and even the grandparents. My second point is that the long-term PMI will need to develop exposure science tools. This is from a paper that, the original paper of, of Chris Wilde in 2005, where he um, likened the analogy of the genome and the exposome to a male fiddler crab with one very large claw and one very small, almost atrophied claw. The ease of genotyping has definitely shifted us in the direction of, of developing uh, the genome and away from exposure biomarkers. And understanding the complex interplay of, of exposure and genetic susceptibility because of that is in its absolute infancy. But what makes it even more complicated is the exposome is dynamic. It changes with time. We're not all exposed to the same thing every single day which is very different than the genome. And both need to be reliably measured to be able to look at G by E. So that means we need to develop better tools looking at the exposome. And um, I guess this is very Star Trekian. So I suggest that we go after first for the new PMI, maybe this is a five year rather than a 10 year, um, the low hanging fruit. And by that I mean I've been hearing over the last two days and these two days that we're thinking of enrolling hospital-based, large HMO, existing cohorts. But I'm suggesting that we also have some overlapping protocols at the initial point and then at follow-up points. Otherwise, it's very hard to pool data that's very different together. That we think about the fact that the electronic medical record's not there yet. As a member of Kaiser, I can get a memory stick and I can, when I travel to Europe, I have my medical information on that memory stick or when I'm out of the state, someone, if I have to go to an emergency room, a doctor can see where, what my medical conditions are. Right now in the United States, it's impossible. As someone as an epidemiologist who does this kind of thing, it's really impossible to emerge administrative registry, crime data, birth data, death data across state lines. It takes a lot of effort. And to me, the PMI needs to figure out a better way, like Scandinavia, to be able to merge those kinds of data. Um, we also be, need, need to be able to merge with different environmental data. There's a lot of data that's currently being collected from the state, different states, the EPA. We have air and water quality. We have pesticide use data in California 
um, not across the United States. These data are geocoded, and so we should be able to merge some of these data sets. We need to be able to geocode addresses, and that means that a lot of people move a lot of times, and we need to get that information over time. And we need to save routinely collected specimens. And what very, is very frustrating is uh, doing a lot of pregnancy studies is that there are bloods that are routinely collected, urines that are re routinely collected, amnio, amniotic fluid that's routinely collected that are just tossed. And you think about what a great biorepository we would have if we could create and use the specimens that are about to be tossed. And we actually did that in four counties in California. And in no time flat, we had uh, amniotic fluid samples and blood samples from 10,000 people. Um, but there's also other kinds of screening that happens that we also toss data on, not just the prenatal ones, things like the um, uh, child-led bloods. Very hard to collect blood from children, but yet we collect routinely child-led bloods from certain populations. Those bloods are thrown out. We have the results, but we don't have the bloods. Um, one thing that's kind of a creative thought is starting at age 50, many people have fecal adult blood tests. What if we could do the microbiome in those and keep them over time so that we can begin to look at the microbiome and environment and genetics? Um, they are also very easy to collect specimens. Yes, this builds a huge biorepository, but they're easy to collect. And so things like deciduous teeth in children, but what if we got teeth from cadavers? Well, we know that the teeth of an of a adult is, develops early in life. We could analyze those teeth eventually to be able to look at early life exposures to different chemicals. Uh, cord blood, placentas, hair, nails, all of those things are easy to collect. But not everything can be measured in a drop of blood. I've heard this over and over again at meetings. Just get a drop of blood from everybody, we'll store a drop of blood. In our very small birth cohort study, it's not that small, but it's small relative to Scandinavia, we collected 150,000 stored samples of all different types. And the reason why we did that is because we were interested in lots of different chemicals, and the ones in bold are the media that the best media to measure a particular chemical in. So not everything can be measured in blood easily. Some things are measured in urine, and some things are best measured in teeth. So I guess I believe in the le next 10 years, we can develop an exposure fingerprint across the life course that this is not going to be easy, that we've got to build up that atrophied fiddler crab claw. And that means we need to further develop the omics. In order to do that, we need to know what they mean. So that means we need to examine a multiple matrices. We need to determine their sensitivity. We need to validate their measure against something we do know what it means, like um, our air pollution. We need to figure out are these going to be as easy as doing genotyping of the entire population? Can we do something that's cost effective? We need to sit, consider other ways to characterize human exposures to su in sub-studies. I, I mentioned to Anne, what if we got a screening questionnaire on lots of people, but then we validated that questionnaire with exposure studies, whether they're biomarker studies or environmental measures, because it's not just everything we're measuring in blood and not just everything we're measuring in urine, but some things are best measured in the environment itself. And we need to refine and develop geospatial models and methods. Um, I know that um, my colleague, um, Marilyn Miranda, spoke yesterday, but in California, we have now developed something called the Cal Enviro Screen, where somebody can go online and put their address in and see what kind of air pollution and pesticide use and water quality is right in their community. That's the kind of interactive involvement I see in 10 years from now, that people can really look at what they're being exposed to. And it's happening right now. Um, but we need to also develop interesting and novel um, environmental sensors. I'm involved with two of these. 
Uh, one is where people can put on silicon bracelets, wear those silicon bracelets like Live Strong, except it doesn't say Live Strong. And we can now, uh, Kim Anderson at, at Oregon, can now measure the chemicals in those bracelets. We can also look at deciduous teeth in children, and the tooth is embryologically formed like the rings of a tree. And at the moment of birth, there's an, a line that's formed. And so we can see by weak gestation what children may have been exposed to in utero and in the early postnatal period. Hopefully one day, we will also have sensors that we can put into one of the four watches that somebody was wearing yesterday, Russ. <laughs> um, we're, we're not there yet. We're beginning to look at that with air pollution. I hope that one day we can look at other chemicals like pesticides. So our challenge is big, looking at the environment, we, in order to measure the exposome. But I don't think it's any more difficult than the one faced three de decades ago when we decided to map the human genome. We need to face this challenge, and the reason why we need to face this challenge is that the public wants to know what they're exposed to. We get asked all the time what is going on in our community. And also, I shouldn't have to say this to this group here, is that genes may not explain a large proportion of the disease, that it's really about the epigenome and what modifies it, the nutrition, the physical, the chemical, and the social environments. And that brings me to my next point, point three. The long-term PMI needs to consider both the chemical and the social environments, the non-chemical stressors. There is now a growing body of data which shows that um, even early life adverse experiences can have profound effects in adult health, whether it's chronic disease or mental illness. And so we need to be able to look at those early life exposures to know about the adjustment of that child as an adult. And there may be cycles of disadvantages, so it's like Again, that grandmother's disadvantage that's passed on to the mother, that's, or that's passed on to the uh, child. And I shouldn't just say mother. The father plays a very important role in everything that I'm talking about, and we know very little information about paternal exposures. So I'm sure many of you have seen this quote. When it comes to your health, your zip code may be more important than your genetic code. And that is, again, a growing body of data that shows it's a lot of the larger environment, discrimination, violence, poverty, affect your health, not just your genes. And there's not enough information about that interaction between that part of the environment and genes. So my, point, my fourth point is that the long-term PMI is not just going to be about cancer. It's going to be about optimizing health and well-being. And as someone who's trained as a neuroscientist, I would love to see that the initiatives of the brain initiative gets combined with the precision medicine initiative. I envision that we will begin to image people over time and be able to look at, before it happens, what happens with Alzheimer's, what happens with neurodevelopmental problems, and put these two initiatives together. Um, a case in point is a colleague of mine from Columbia, Ginny Rao, has done uh, brain surfacing measures, MRIs, functional MRIs, and, and volumetric MRIs, and has shown how different chemicals in the environment may actually affect the volumes of different parts of the brain. I hope that we can do that with other environmental chemicals as well. My fifth point and my last point is that it's not going to be just about observation but it's about intervention, and we've all been talking about genetic intervention. I want to talk about exposure intervention, preventing exposures before they happen. And there's a great study that just came out this month from uh, USC, which showed that improved air quality affects the lung development of children. We need to prevent exposures before they happen. We need to prevent disease before they happen, not just the medical model, but the public health model. So my prescription, this was obvious, <laughs> I think we need to include pregnant women. But I'm also a realist and recognize that the PMI may not want to include pregnant women. But if the PMI 
enrolls only adult women, adult, uh, sorry, one million adults, then I suggest that we don't start at age 40, like the UK Biobank, but that we start with reproductive age. And if we were to enroll reproductive age men and women, we would get, in one year's time, if we enrolled one million, I estimate about 18,000 pregnancies. If we follow people over time, we'll get a lot more. So that if we keep the demographics roughly the same as the general US population. So this is my back of the envelope calculation. Why do we want to do this? Because chronic disease will surface with pregnancy, immune disease, cardiovascular disease. Because then we get to get collect preconception information on the father as well as the mother. That we gather data on the parents and the grandparents. And that we can then do in the future, the children and subsequent generations to look at the multi-generational studies. Um, I think it's important that we focus on G by E, not just G to pinpoint therapies. And I have one example from our own research. Okay, am I over? Um, like seven minutes on. We have 17 right now. Oh, okay. I can just stop here. Um, I won't show my own results. <laughs> so this is my vision of the next generation of PMI. This is just a summary of the five points that I just made. Thank you. I owe you coffee. <laughs> I owe you more than coffee. <laughs> I didn't see you stand. <laughs> We're going to have a seat now and have the panelists come up and discuss this further. The market will impact us in many ways. We should, <laughs> it's one of my roles here, I think. <laughs> uh, that was an excellent uh, range of, I think, provocative thoughts, starting from Zach. Uh, there's Jen Jen Jennifer definitely uh, challenging us with what we're actually gonna do with this. Um, a couple of themes that I had heard there that I wanna uh, push the panelists to help us evolve a little bit further uh, is actually how we implement some of these things to make them happen 10 years from now. And I heard a theme across, which is, familial enrollment as opposed to participant enrollment. Um, that if we really want to do this, we, we can't just go after proband, we have to go after proband plus a lot more. Um, thoughts on, on how we make that happen and, and if you've had success stories on how we actually make that happen, uh, that would be welcome. So um, a few years ago, after being very bored by uh, discussion about standards in bioinformatics, we actually uh, launched a, a challenge to diagnose uh, two family, uh, to di diagnose kids with um, possibly genetic uh, disorders, and we asked uh, the families to uh, contribute their DNA and you know pro bono sequencing, and th two observations. One is all the family members were very well willing to con contribute their, their data, and second of all, in the two cases where we were able to provide a meaningful diagnosis, knowing the genetics of the parents was incredibly useful. And so I think that, um, I'm trying to see if I should add you uh, from 40 years and bring you down, bring us down to uh, even younger, but it turns out that having families, especially families of kids with uh, diseases, is very um, straightforward to do. Mm -hmm. They're very empowered. They're very um, minute in the details they're willing to document. And although I know a lot of studies stay away from them because of uh, a perception that the consent issues are more complicated, in fact, I think we would get a uh, very strong uptake. Scientifically, I think it would be uh, a higher payoff. And uh, technologically, I'm, I'm not sure why we can't do it. So is that a model where you find a, uh, a exceptional individual, either genotypically or phenotypically, and then go recontact? I was thinking more a world of, we would certainly do that in this cohort, but recruit families at a time, that when you recruit an individual, at the same time, you ask them, and by the way, take this pamphlet home for your 
wife, your mother, your daughter. What thoughts about that and if you had success with that? Well, I've had success in certain contexts. So for example, in Italy, a study that we're doing, um, we are much more likely to have success in getting the children if we get the mother too. And you can imagine there's a, a real close family network. In um, my Mexican population in the Salinas Valley, that's also the case, but it's likely we're not going to get the father. So it really depends on the cultural and uh, social economic characteristics of the population you're dealing with. There's good data showing that um, the reason every single hospital has an OB ward is because the, the female head of household makes healthcare decisions of the household. And that drives business, uh, putting my business hat on, that drives the rest of the business. You're more likely to have your appendectomy there and the father's gonna get their prostate removed because the mother at some point had her delivery there 10 years earlier. Is there a strategy where you start and, and you, where you're aggressive about ensuring that we're recruiting in, in areas where we've got bio samples? Uh, uh, from an in, a payer's perspective, uh, how would you consider a, a precision medicine initiative focused on, on women's health? Uh, would that be more exciting or less exciting as we try and identify people that may need to be sharing data with us? So we'll be coming to Anthem to say, share your data with us and what would excite you? Would a woman's health initiative there excite you or disincentivize you? Well, I think there are a, a, a lot of different areas. I think, you know, women's health is really focused on, um, you know, the impact on the child's health. And I think what we're really trying to understand here is the impact over the continuum. So I think there are different ways of en engaging, um, you know, with people through their health insurance company, although that might not be the, the most effective strategy. Um, the, um, I was thinking based on Brenda's presentation, if, if we wanna really um, also maximize understanding people's exposures, maybe one part of the cohort would be to recruit people the way we do the census and go door to door and recruit members of a household. Um, and that might build on both the, the familial community aspect of as well as um, getting um, exposure history. And then just the last thing though, I think which is one of the other parts of your comments, which is um, not necessarily a recruitment strategy, but I think we do have um, tremendous data that we can contribute as an insurance company. Richard and I were talking about Health Corps, which is our research subsidiary, which participates in the Sentinel program and so we do have people's claims data, um, some linkages with EHR data, linkages with Lab LabQuest and LabCorp and Quest data. So there are other um, data sources that um, that could be brought in that might be helpful in, in defining phenotypes and risks. I just, I just want to amplify that. It's amazing how much genetics you can do with claims data. So I have the privilege of working with uh, Aetna. They have uh, 33 million lives. And for example, that's uh, approximately 50,000 kids with autism. And what you can do is you can look at what is the recurrence rate, an objective, unbiased rate of what's the recurrence rate. And you can see that the recurrence rate, if you, if you have one child, a male, then the chance of the, the next boy having autism, one in nine. If your first case is a girl, the chance of the, next, of the boy having autism, one in four. These are very hard numbers with very small confidence intervals that you're getting just for free out of the claims data, completely unexploited. And I think, again, uh, these executives of these insurance companies, they have a business to run, but if you're willing to engage with them, they are actually trying to, willing to do real science with you. Josh? So that was actually one of the questions we were um, interested in pursuing more. And, um, uh, you know, in terms, if you think about the precision medicine cohorts, it could be open to lots of people. Do you think there would be general interest from insurance companies to share that data into um, repositories that could be mined by lots of people and um, put with other types of data from EHRs, from surveys, from mobile technologies, et cetera? Um, d I mean, definitely, I think um, many of the large insurance companies have research subsidiaries that, that interact um, with both 
um, you know, government and academic researchers as well as the industry to support that kind of research. Health Corps is, is Anthem's research, research subsidiary. Um, United has, I think, in, Ingenix is now Optum, but they have one. Kaiser has, you know, a, a very large and robust research program. Um, and so, you know, I think there's a, a lot of, of ways of, of gaining access to to data, you know, I mean, one of the challenges just is that with insurance data is that um, it's often discontinuous because people, um, you know, disenroll and enroll, and it's it's one of the things actually that health courts work really hard to do because people may switch employers and it may look like they're disenrolling when they're not really disenrolling. They're keeping, say, their Anthem insurance, but um, but that data is definitely available. I'd be happy to. to talk more with anyone about it and, and put you in touch with different folks. Got Esteban and then Sue and uh, Iris. Great. Brendan, that was a nice job. Um, I really am a big advocate of the life course event, so um, I, I support what you said. One of the things that you didn't mention is something that you're very famous for, which is you were able to recruit a population that really out of the fold of the medical system, which is largely farm workers, parallel economy, cash economy, um, not the highest SES in education, but you managed to bring them in. I was struck by um, a detail that I heard recently when I was considering this committee was that for all the Hispanics that signed up for Obamacare or the uh, Affordable Care Act, 80% did it by uh, iPhone. So mm -hmm. could you share with us how you were able to incorporate this marginalized population into a major study that, to me, just seems out of reach for this PMI initiative. Fortunately, at the time that we started our study, the only way we could get a window into the health of the community was the fact that all people in the state could get um, prenatal care. And so even though probably about half of our population were undocumented, we could get in them into the study, but it really took us being clear to them that we were not part of the INS, <laughs> that we're not going to deport them, mm. which meant that we had to employ people from the community that were trusted by the, by the participants. They were bicultural um, and, and also bilingual, obviously. But they had to be trusted, which meant that they weren't necessarily had their PhDs or had a master's degree, but they were high school community workers that we trained to be able to integrate with the community and to be our arm into the community. Now we have people, our children are 15 years old. We've been following the same cohort for all these years, and they just want to have their other children part of our study. <laughs> but Again, the father is not very, always very present because in our population, the father is migrating and the women are staying still. So they're, they're, they're still partnered, but they're not present. So getting information on that person is not possible. So it really is working closely with the communities. By the way, most of them do have phones. Most of them do not have smartphones. So it would be doing something to give them a smartphone. Um, which means that they're also not computer savvy. We had to teach women how to use computers in our population because we wanted to be able to use a kiosk. We found that they were not really literate in either English nor Spanish. So we had to do everything using earphones. Um, so there are lots of obstacles, but we were able to surmount them. And as I said, they've been since age one, most of the cohort's been with us. Sue? Yeah, this question's uh, directed to Jennifer, actually, and this is around the insurance company and participation in the PMI over time. So we know that the health system is so pressurized by cost, and we also know the regulatory, and I think it was you who talked about the ecosystem being brought along. Mm -hmm. So as, as we think about that, and we think about the health economics and the benefits to what the PMI cohort could bring to the system, how is the insurance industry sort of gathering together to help the PMI actually advance? And you don't have to answer that in 
one question, because I know it's a broader mm -hmm. question. Mm -hmm. uh, and then the, the second one I would say is, and you mentioned this with regards to the member churn, mm -hmm. is, the industry, is the insurance companies or the industry actually coming together to develop a patient-centric longitudinal, just like the centralized uh, payers are in, in other countries, database, if you'd like, that the sharing of that information could actually really empower the PMI's success over time. So two questions embedded all around, really, the, mm -hmm. the, the industry in general. Um, well, I think, you know, for, for your first question, probably the, the closest example is PCORI. So the insurance industry is very engaged in PCORI. You know, there's a, a head tax on the insured that helps provide a large percent of the funding for PCORI. And representatives from the different companies participate at different levels within the, um, the, the advisory groups or other groups at PCORI. So I think, you know, that model may be one way of engaging the insurance industry um, in the PMI, I, I don't know that, I mean, this is also very new. I don't know that any of us have been directly engaged up until now. Um, and then in terms, I mean, I think the, the issue with longitudinal records is something that I know at Anthem we've been struggling a lot with. And I think, you know, not just us, but I think it's across, you know, it's, it's across our, um, our system. And it, you know, manifests in many different ways. I was at a conference last week for the Community Oncology Alliance, and the practices were complaining, why can't you all just have the same infrastructure that we submit our claims to? And I said, well, if we have a single payer system, that would work. But right, you know, for, for whatever reason in our culture, we value the, the, the multi-payer system, and so it, it creates its, its really own. really long term now we're getting into <laughs> <laughs> um, but I, th so I think, you know, so there's some technical, you know, but even within one insurance company, people will change plans. And so even just getting those to be longitudinal, actually, it seems very straightforward, but it, it takes putting the resources and investment and time to do it. Um, in California, um, Blue Cross, or Anthem is Blue Cross in California, and then there's a separate Blue Shield health plan in California. And um, um, we've come together there to create the Cal Index, which is a longitudinal record there. So I think there are efforts happening, but um, you know, it requires people understanding the value and then also investment, because it's, you know, it is challenging to overcome you know, to come up with unique identifiers that can track people through these different data systems. I saw just a brief, brief comment that the value has, has been there for decades. You know, it was the life insurance industry that figured out decades before the EPI community that smoking caused death and disease. <laughs> We're uh, I want to be mindful of six minutes left, so given this is the long-term scenario, I want to make sure we're focusing on 10 to 20-year comments and infrastructure we need now. Please. Excellent comments were made by uh, Brenda first on connecting maybe and informing this project by other projects that were funded by NIH, uh, where vast data is going to be created. I highlight the Alzheimer's Summit where we are, uh, and, and consequences of this, where we are connecting on thousands of patients metabolomics data, connecting this to information on the gut microbiome, imaging, genomics, and integrated approach. Uh, uh, another comment made by Jennifer on uh, predicting drug response phenotype is hugely important. And I think uh, there are two consortia th uh, that we mentioned, the pharmacogenomics and the pharmacometabolomics that partnered over many years and generated vast data on the impact of the diet, the gut microbiome, and how these can inform the genome and complement our vision and our knowledge on drug response variation to statins, antidepressants, and, and others. So connecting the dots of information, I think, is going to be extremely useful. Mm -hmm. Excellent comment. Yeah. I think we'd all agree with. Uh, Eric's been uh, waiting sorry. for a bit. So given that this is long term, I mean, there's at least two, I've been thinking about Isaac's approach to T plus, and I actually think the committee ought to be thinking about what are going to be fairly ubiquitous technologies and capabilities at different timelines, and then try to figure out how to intercept that. There's two that are going to, that, that, that really obtain to, to the conversation. Sensing is basically going to be free, 
right? I mean, it's like anything that you want to sense is basically going to be free in the time frames that we're talking about. And they will be integrated into just consumer electronics and wearable patches and even implantables in the time frame that we're talking about. I mean, we just have to start thinking about that and anticipating that. And the other is intelligent agents. I mean, just, you know, for what Google has done for search, right, the intelligent agents, and you're just starting to see it. You're starting to see it from all the vendors. But in the time frame that we're talking about, you've got to assume that this is pretty much a ubiquitous technology um, for 70 to 80 percent of the cohort. And we're always going to have those who don't have access, and we're going to have to deal with that. Can you now um, articulate 80-20 rules from an exposomics perspective of, you know, it will be expensive for us to do it in the early stages, but, but will become basically free over the time of the study. Can you articulate an 80-20 rule now of what you want captured? Um, um, and on the, you know, sort of um, um, agent side of it, is there a body of knowledge around decision support from clinicians to consumers that we can use that helps us anticipate when people have the power of a, a personal agent that they're going to be using in every other aspect of their lives that's going to be part of their, you know, everyday capabilities that they're going to be using as they move about life. I think we'll have time for a response to that and maybe one more comment is probably what's likely. So quick, a backward pointer to 1981 uh, or 84, the Garden Angel Project, Peter Solovich, uh, MIT, articulated this vision in terms of an 80-20 vision. Um, 80-20, uh, we know that the commercial entities will have these agents deployed for a variety of reasons, and not in uh, 15 years, but in five years. Um, and I think that uh, you'll see a consumer economy that will support that in about five years. Um, I would, uh, there's, I think, many now good, robust, reproducible, reproducible studies around environmental wide association studies. I uh, direct you to Shirag Patel's and Atul Butte's uh, prior studies. And if you look at their, those reproducible peaks around, for example, diabetes. Uh, I think we could at least come up with a subset of the exposop that we should measure, but it, it's it's a subset. I don't know how big the, the superset's gonna be. Can I make a comment on that? So first of all, I think we should be cautioned against looking at cross-sectional studies. There's all sorts of biases that are introduced by looking at, for example, in Haines and understanding human exposure and health from that. That it's really the longitudinal studies that are really important in terms of the uh, what, what I would do right now, I would invest in building good biorepositories. I would make sure that we collected enough biological samples of different types in the ways that are going to be usable for the future. And I would make sure that we collect the um, administrative data from across different states that could also be melded together with addresses and geographic information. Those are, to me, the best planning for the future. And I guess depending on what the different types of exposures are, you, you may be able to start leveraging, you know, it, it won't be population-based, but um, maybe more convenient samples. So integrating with, say, Fitbit or some of the technologies that are out there that are already, you know, people are already providing their data. I think we've got, uh, out of respect, we'll do um, one com short comment, please, if we could, and then the gentleman that was waiting over there, please. Yeah, <laughs> although I had um, one, uh, two questions and a comment, but I'll restrict it you to will comment. You have time for two questions okay, and a one, comment. One, one, <laughs> one comment. That is, in addition to collecting, I fully agree with this life course um, um, approach. And one of the things that we might want to con um, uh, collect is also the population history in the sense um, uh, inbreeding levels, consanguinity, demography, that means drift and other things, would be helpful because those are the some of the determinants of child health and also adult health. Thank you. Excellent. Back. Yes, sir. If you could introduce yourself, sure. please. My name is John Birch, and I'm a private investor. Uh, I'm uh, fascinated by this whole discussion. Uh, I, I seem to be looking at it all with a, with a sort of a filtered lens. I see data, data everywhere, but not a drop to drink, or at least not too many. And uh, I'm, I'm uh, very interested in something that you said, Jennifer. Uh, you seem to be touching on something that, that was, I, I hear very little about, which is the cognitive limits of clinicians. <laughs> there was a study by the uh, National Research Council a few years ago that, that got into that. It was one of the most neglected studies, I think, <laughs> out there. And with all the amount of data that is 
we're talking about here, longitudinal and, and just many, many more additional sources, uh, you seem to be touching on the use not just of clinical decision support, but of actual what I call computer-aided diagnosis, picking up on work research that was done you know, 20, 30 years ago, uh, Mylan and, and others. Uh, the, uh, or Mycin, I guess it was called, sorry. Uh, anyway, have you done some work on that? And the FDA is in particular going to be involved. It seems to me, I guess this would just be a suggestion that this, the committee, the PMI group, ought to really start looking at the use of computer support to analyze this data, whether it's for clinicians, read out or for patients uh, or for other people as well. But I think clinical diagnostic use of this data with a computer as the doing the diagnostic work has got to be included in, the, in, in what's being looked at and I think we have to check with the FDA on that. Jennifer, any final parting thoughts on? Do you push your button? I think it's critical that we uh, have the research to understand how we're going to be able to use this complex information. I think there's a tendency, you know, there's all sorts of studies about how when there's information overload, people hyper focus on one area. So, you know, we need to understand how people are going to, you know, both the clinicians and the, the consumers or patients, how they're going to use this information and, and how we can help people be able to use it um, in a way that helps them. Yeah. I think with that, we're going to switch over. We've, um, I, I wanted to highlight two topics that you'd both mentioned, which was the, the workforce that will need to be trained. We talked about the workforce to analyze this, but Jennifer touched on the, the workforce to actually do something with this. And then Zach had talked about a, a new consumer of value, which is actually the, the patient and monetization. I think we'll be discussing that in other forum, so I wanted to not forget the monetization of this from the patient's perspective. Richard is uh, going to be taking up to, uh, take us off to lunch, I believe. Well, thanks very much. Firstly, I, it's been an amazing uh, last uh, two days, and uh, I really want to uh, thank first uh, all of the speakers and uh, moderators, uh, second, all of the working group members, and third, uh, all of the participants who uh, everyone really dropped everything in order to uh, get here on uh, incredibly short notice, and uh, we're all just extraordinarily grateful to everyone for that. In addition, I want to uh, thank the incredible NIH staff who, again, in uh, uh, organizing this with extraordinarily uh, short uh, timeline, uh, under incredible pressure with extraordinary grace, and uh, Gwyn uh, Jenkins and others. Uh, just a round of applause for everyone. Thank you so much. It's been a truly exciting uh, meeting. Our goal in this meeting was to try to get as much out on the table uh, as you can, and like any uh, great feast, boy, is it going to take a while to digest everything. <laughs> and I'm not going to uh, uh, make uh, any effort to, to do that at this time. Uh, but I will reflect uh, on uh, just a couple of points that I think have uh, been pervasive throughout uh, the discussions. If you think about where we have made uh, significant progress in going from a lack of understanding of disease causation to new understandings, uh, the two places that have really stood out have been Mendelian genetics and cancer. And those have been driven by the realization that there are single mutations with large effect that are driving those diseases. The more common diseases that we see in the hospital every day uh, are not, uh, we are coming to realize, likely to be driven in the main by single mutations with large effect, even rare collections of single mutations uh, with large effect. And that, of course, is going to retrain our thinking about what are we missing in our analysis uh, up to date. And one of the elements that we have heard a lot about uh, in our discussions uh, uh, over the last two days uh, has been the effects of environment. And it is no great surprise from everything that we know from uh, epidemiology that environment is going to have major determinants and that at the end of the day, we realize that it is going to be gene by environment interactions that are going to be playing a major role. And if we want to make progress uh, in these areas, 
trying to understand uh, what those likely heterogeneous environmental factors are and how they're interacting with uh, uh, equally heterogeneous uh, genetic factors, how those combinations come to lead to uh, disease causation uh, in individuals uh, in our population. Uh, and I think this uh, frames the thinking about where we need to be going and obviously motivates why we are likely to need very large uh, cohorts. And getting uh, back to uh, some of the earlier discussion uh, this morning, uh, the genome was a bounded problem at the time that uh, we took it on. We realized that uh, we could solve this as a bounded problem. Measuring the environment is a much less bounded problem and therefore much more challenging. And so I greatly appreciated uh, the cautionary uh, note that at the outset, we ought to plan for it without necessarily being able to specify exactly what it is that we need to measure, but we ought to be planning to be able to capture the information in some way. And I think that's an incredibly important uh, uh, message. The second thing that I think was a generally useful uh, point and something that uh, I appreciated a lot and took away a lot from this is the new technologies that we have to measure uh, both the environment and also the effects of the environment uh, in the human body and the ability to rapidly and inexpensively uh, analyze uh, metabolites that we have not previously measured in any systematic way uh, in humans as well as uh, being able to analyze how the immune system is changing and responding over time. I think these are uh, very important opportunities going forward. And of course, it was incredibly exciting to hear about uh, what can be done in taking all these orthogonal data sets and analyzing them and coming up with uh, uh, likely robust uh, results that are going to point to important pathways that uh, we can modulate both for prevention uh, and therapy in, uh, uh, in when people do develop uh, disease. And lastly, I think uh, it was very inspiring to me to hear about the remarkable progress in social media uh, to uh, advance the patient participation, uh, uh, individual uh, participation in studies, uh, whether they're patients uh, or not. And the examples that uh, we heard this morning about how to engage uh, people longitudinally to A, have interest, uh, B, participate in a remarkable way. I was most impressed uh, by how much self-report information uh, uh, has been useful uh, in a variety of studies uh, that uh, have been uh, uh, very productive. Uh, and keeping uh, the individuals who uh, are participating in the studies uh, both engaged and satisfied that their engagement uh, has been productive for them personally uh, is extraordinarily uh, important. So our job is to take all of this information uh, in and start digesting it and thinking about uh, how we can use the remarkable advice that we've gotten over the last couple of days uh, in order to begin uh, formulating plans. Uh, and uh, to that end, uh, the next steps, I uh, uh, want to first, again, thank everyone who uh, participated. Second, remind uh, everyone that the uh, video uh, interviews are still going on across the hall in rooms uh, F1 and F2. They'll be open until 1 o'clock today, so please uh, participate if you haven't uh, already. Uh, we're now going to adjourn the public session. Uh, this afternoon, the working group uh, will go into a closed session to uh, have further discussion and begin digesting uh, what we've heard over the last two days. So the working group will now take a 20-minute break uh, to get lunch and reorganize in rooms C1 and C2 at 1220 for a working lunch. Uh, and uh, please, uh, there's uh, staff at the table who can help you get a taxi if you need to uh, uh, get a cab to get where you're going next. And again, thanks everyone for a terrific uh, two-day work week. <laughs>